Welcome back to Demystify Sci. I'm Anastasia. I'm Shiloh. And today we are taking a tour through the history of science and studying the tendrils and history of an alternative to the Newtonian mechanical mathematical uh, shut up and calculate paradigm. So as many of you know, a couple of weeks ago, I went to this conference called the Renewal of Science Conference, and it was down in Menlo Park at the Computer History Museum. And what I found there was really kind of astounding. It was the first time that I'd been to a conference where there was not a clear thread of disciplines. Like it wasn't a biology conference. It wasn't a physics conference. It wasn't a chemistry conference. It was a conference where a selection of scholars presented their work on hidden pieces of nature. Things that were visible in plain sight, but had been either forgotten or passed over in our fervor to pursue more obviously fruitful technical accomplishments. And yet, there were these really interesting features, like oddities about the boiling temperature of water, the fact that electrical current didn't seem to be related to the flow of electrons, the fact that strange cymatic patterns in fluids appeared very biological and rhythmic and symmetrical. And so no one had a complete theory of nature, but it was a bunch of people who were looking at really interesting pieces of the world and heavily suggesting that perhaps it was worth studying them more. And so on the show today, we have Austin Abicht, who was one of the organizers of the conference. We've had another organizer of the conference, Gopi Vijaya, on before, who's going to come back on in a couple of weeks. We also have a bunch of the speakers that presented at the conference coming in the next few weeks. But before we get there, I thought it would be really good for us to sit down with a conversation. I thought it would be really good for us to sit down for a conversation with Austin so he could give us a sense of what the goal of the project was. Because even as I was there, it was never explicitly stated, but I could tell that there was a philosophy that ran through all of these talks. And so our conversation today is an attempt to place that philosophy front and center. So as we host the rest of the conversations, we have a sense of how all of these ideas connect and the intellectual tradition that they come from which is not the purely Newtonian tradition, it is the Gothian tradition, if I was to say it as a general label. Remember, guys, podcast is entirely supported by listeners, and we want to keep it that way. We're going to come hell or high water and not paste ads on this podcast, and we're not going to sell other people's stuff. If you do want to buy a t-shirt, however, <laughs> down below we have t-shirts for sale. Uh, but seriously, come over and check out our Patreon site. It's a really cool community. It's getting smarter and smarter, I'm noticing, right? I feel like there's a lot of really interesting, cool people joining all the time. Don't be intimidated by that. No, it's just a really like diverse intellectual zoo of people who are interested in the future of ideas and the scientific landscape, the philosophical landscape, the technological landscape. And we all get together once a week and chat over Zoom. And I love seeing you guys there. And if you're listening and you have a couple dollars a month you can spare to keep the lights on here, please come join the Patreon group. It's at patreon.com slash demystifysci. If you don't have any money right now, cool. Hang out. Uh, tell people about the podcast. It's like you can do a lot just to keep this thing moving in the right direction by participating. Come over to one of our discussion groups, Discord, Facebook, wherever. We're Instagram, probably there. Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. Spotify comments, Apple Music comments, YouTube comments, literally yeah. any place with a search bar. We are there. Yeah, just hang out, participate. Tell us uh, what you're interested in. Tell us your thoughts about these conversations. Tell us what we could do better. And for now, enjoy the conversation with Austin, and we'll see you next time. The scientific revolution starts now. A lot of the original proceedings of science were done to the French Royal Academy, not the British one. And a lot of that stuff, if you want to trace the letters and the exchanges, like if you want to see Descartes' writing, not all of Descartes has been translated. Yeah. And so it's which it's is kind of wild. Uh, I mean, the one of the things that Gopi ran into with some of his color research early on was that the 
like the Farbenlera, Goethe's the Farbenlera, um, or study of colors, uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, one of the main sections of it hadn't even been translated, like a primary argument, if you will, hadn't been translated until less than a decade ago or something. It was like really, really bad. Um, <laughs> well, Goethe is supposed to be a poet. And so I think that people are deeply uncomfortable with the idea of Goethe as scientist. Because they're like, that's the guy who wrote Faust. Like, wh what do you mean he's got color theories? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, when you get into the specialist literature in for color, uh, for the study of color, like he pops up. Uh, so he ends up, There's there are arguments. And if you're going to have an argument back and forth, like you, it might be good if you're making the argument in English and the predominant scientific language today is English that maybe maybe you know something that's only about 60 or 70 pages or so should have been translated uh yeah but anyway i mean it's hard to argue against that yeah. in general i mean I look way, everybody used to be like 20 different hats right oh yeah like you like huygens he's like a physician and a like local councilman and also building telescopes and then studying the wave nature of light like people are just like how do, how do you fit that many it's amazing actually my favorite is newton after because everybody knows you know alchemist everybody knows physicist but then he turns into a counterfeit agent for the royal mint and spends all of his time like dressing up as a beggar to go to pubs to see if he can actually catch people in the act of passing counterfeit coins yeah i i have always found his connection to i think it's the what is it, the treasury or whatever it was rather very interesting considering the direction that oh just science in our society in general has has gone like you end up having at the heart of science like our modern scientific thought, like this guy who is like this with the monetary policies of, of Britain, which is it's a good, em good employer. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Uh, so, well, so this is actually a really neat segue into what we're going to talk about today, which is that most people, when they think of modern science, they think of this very cohesive, concise trajectory that you can roughly trace back to the Enlightenment and in the Enlightenment, you have Descartes, you have Newton. It's this foment of ideas between these two. And they just put out so much into the world that everybody else follows in the footsteps of giants for the next two to three hundred years, bringing us to the present day where we have this neat picture of science as having a very discreet history. And you're part of a foundation, you're part of a group that argues that there's actually a, a different tree of scientific history that has run in parallel perhaps in obscurity relative to newton and his descendants and so to give people a context for what we're going to talk about today i wonder if you could loosely explain what that alternative tradition is and what it offers in contrast with the newtonian tradition okay um I would like to add a little bit to that, and I would end up going back even farther from Newton and Descartes uh, to really set the stage for what becomes the scientific revolution. So our modern world really begins with the Italian Renaissance in a bunch of different respects. And you've got a number of figures there that are, you know, Raphael, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, you know, the masters, right? Um, that they're, like we were talking about earlier, they, they wear all of these different hats. And they wear them all so well that we put them up on this pedestal. Uh, you know, you, maybe Leonardo's engineering work didn't immediately go into application in any of these fields, but he's the his foresight basically projects forward all or not all but a great deal of the developments in modern that we've come to in modern science you know he's got these drawings of helicopters all sorts of crazy stuff but he's also an excellent artist is an architect the anatomy is tough is off the hook i mean yeah. his, his anatomy work was just unbelievable 
yeah, laying the foundations for modern medicine. <laughs> yeah, through through art, um, the investigating the laws of perspective, uh, perspective geometry, opening up the door to non Euclidean geometries, generally speaking. Um, so the modern uh new gestalt capacity if you will is like coming onto the scene in a really really strong way and it's all it it has it hasn't yet dissipated or dissociated into these different avenues you have the religious impulse you have the artistic impulse and the scientific impulse if you will like completely unified in these guys uh you you, you can't really thread them apart or else what they do and what motivated them would just start to crumble um and one of the other things that maybe would be a, a good segue or at least like a picture to give um is there's this one painting it's pretty famous it's Raphael's the school of athens right and it kind of encapsulates well, the spirit of the renaissance and a great in a great number of respects, is that they're taking all of everything that the Greco-Roman world had to offer and are trying to revitalize it, but in a way that is new. It's hearkening back to the old, but it's also opening the door to our, our modern world. And you have this image of Plato in the center, and he's like pointing up, right? And then Aristotle, you know. This is the one man. where they're on the steps. Yeah. And, yeah. and so Plato's like walking down the steps with one of his students and then everybody's kind of gathered around them. Correct. Yeah. And the two main center figures are the Plato and Aristotle there. So these two different streams of culture that kind of came together to give the, uh, the impetus for the, what we consider Western culture today in a, in a stricter sense, instead of saying, oh, well, Western culture going back to you know, Greece and Rome, really European Western culture. Um, you have these two streams that weave together that end up uh, giving all the philosophical thought, really a fleshing it out and also the impetus for what we call modern science. Well, um, so it's really interesting because I think the reason people don't view the Renaissance as being part of this story is precisely because of the way that the spirit is woven into it. There's something about the Enlightenment where we get to the Enlightenment, we get to Newton, we get to Descartes, and it seems like they kind of recognize that God must be somewhere in the equation, that there is some spiritual component. But their entire identity is also caged in figuring out how to provide a, a mechanistic view of the world that has nothing to do with religion. That has nothing really to do with the spiritual aspect, and, but I think that I think that your the the insight that the Renaissance is the time where these ideas of even being able to think in these ways starts to appear in an intermeshed way is really is is really valuable. I hadn't I hadn't thought about it that way. And it's uh, just interesting. You go back down a little bit, uh, scroll back down to the right. To the right. Oh, uh, no, sorry. Yeah, that way. This character, you go up. This is supposed to be Michelangelo. Like, there are a number of figures in the Renaissance. The whole uh, uh, zeitgeist, if you will. Um, it, a lot of the faces in here are contributing to this whole thing that we're talking about. So it's, again, this the, unity. This guy over that. here in the bot yep. bottom right? Yeah. 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 I mean, historically, the, it's, I think, supposed to be Heraclitus or something, but the temperamentally and the 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 portrait i think is uh, if i remember correctly is supposed to be of michelangelo Interesting. Um, yeah this guy down here <laughs> that you just scrolled over is supposed to be perhaps socrates it's like drunk and cynic <laughs> on the steps over here yeah. <laughs> amazing yeah yeah so, so this all is the character uh, you've got euclid euclid right there with the the divider compass mm, look at that so basically, there's a sense that something is happening, and the Renaissance is the birth of this mode of thought that hasn't been seen since classical times, and yet it's still going to take, what, like 300 more years before it develops into something that's recognizable to us as the Enlightenment? Yeah. 
Um, it only takes about a hundred years until you get to Galileo uh, and the beginnings of the scientific revolution, though. So it's it's not really so cut and dry. The one really does uh, roll into the other. All of the uh, the techniques that you're developing for uh, the architecture of the time, the sculpture of the time, this way of dealing with the external world in a very precise and systematic way, even if it is for art or these other things, flow into the creation of the scientific instruments that really make uh, scientific re revolution possible in a, in a physical, tangible sense. Mm. Um, it's interesting to me how that academic structure that you see idealized in that painting like it kind of looks like what everybody's dream of like going to university is going to be like it has this uh it has all the seeds for a cult-like organization which is really fascinating to me a what organization a, a cult-like organization right so you have this uh, also known just as a cult yeah a cult okay. yeah. Right? <laughs> i would just want to make sure you heard that right <laughs> yeah cult but hold on so like you have um you have these initiates right in the university structure you have to it's a closed society there's levels of initiation where you're given secret knowledge right it's not necessarily like secret that it's hidden but it's hard to understand how to do you know uh second order differential equations in order to understand how these different dynamical natural structures unfold and so forth right so you're kind of initiated into it uh it just seems like it carries this mystery cult aspect to it from the beginning like this dream of what it means to participate in the knowledge of the universe it's, it's quite yeah. interesting and it still persists to this day I think i'm glad you saw that that was one of the I, w I just wanted to have a nod to that type of an element and i thought that that painting might be able to do that um so yeah there is this element that is you're really trying to tap into the wellspring of culture generally speaking what they saw as the wellspring of culture for the civilizations that came before them to be able to give a new impetus right a rebirth something new uh, and so in that painting the wellspring of culture is an integration of the technical and the spiritual it's a, the integration of a worldly knowledge and a uh priestly knowledge if you will a uh a heavenly knowledge a uh terrestrial knowledge a inner insight and and external observations um but taking place in the context in how that unfolded in ancient greece is very different from how it unfolded today um you've also in that room you have uh, on one of the other sides of the wall, you have the arts. You have a similar painting for the arts as well. So this is predominantly, say, for like philosophy, uh, sciences, the, the world of thought, uh, instead of more of like the world of uh, feeling and expression, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that is why we don't, you don't have a painting of science, per se. This is a painting of philosophy. Uh, and it isn't until really the next hundred years that we get to really enter the scientific revolution full stop. But this it's is worth, po worth pointing out, we, we still are granted doctors of philosophy when we do a PhD. <laughs> I couldn't even say it without the word. When, when we do our ultimate level education in science, at least from an institutional perspective, you're st it still has this remnant of a philosophy, although nobody... In science programs is taking philosophy courses or has any idea about <laughs> anything pertaining to philosophy maybe a few people do but it's not part of the educational pipeline but it's still there right the tendril of natural philosophy still still remains at least the dream but it's worth noting out too that you know the main the main institutional forms of education for all of the guys who are kicking off the scientific revolution, they're coming out of theological universities. You know, the, the scientific discussion as to the nature of the stars is taking place amongst priests, if we're going to put it crudely. <laughs> um, Galileo's arguing against uh, a bunch of Jesuits, basically. 
And the it, you're you're right. The our our modern educational institution our way of thinking is grounded in this sort of medieval university system. Uh, the uh, Just looking back briefly before we start to go forward, the whole intellectual structure of thought, like the Western world uh, really got its intellectual capacities refined in a study of theology. Uh, when you read Thomas Aquinas' stuff, you know, you... If you're starting from his premises, granted, if you start from his premises, the the line of thinking from there is really very impressive. Um, but you have to accept on faith a bunch of a bunch of things, which is unacceptable going forward in our our modern sense. We want to be able to base our knowledge on something very solid, where whether that solidity is something we observe outside of us, or whether that solidity is something that is essential to us uh, on the inside. And this kind of gives us an, an opening into these two different streams of, uh, of thought that are opening up in the Enlightenment and going into the birth of modern philosophy proper, the continuation of, of science moving forward from the scientific revolution. But by, by the way, the, uh, the the church, by the way, was probably the only people who had the money to pay people to sit around and think. Right? That's a that seems yeah. like a really revolutionary concept, and I'm I'm sure there was some. Obviously, there was some antecedent to that with the Greeks and the Sumerians and this class of philosophers that was in some way instrumental. A lot. I, they must have been instrumental to the monarchies at the time and commerce and technology and engineering and so forth. But you see that space in society being carved out again for the first time during medieval uh, church-dominated states. But it's um, no, really funny to me two. that... Oh, go, go ahead. It's really funny to me that the church funds these thinkers who learn how to think. And like you said, you you look at Aquinas and it's this really stunning revelation for thought and logic and reason and the art of actually coming to understand something. And it's hilarious that what it lays the seeds for is that people, once they're like, okay, well, we know how to think now. Perhaps we should think about our foundational assumptions. And that's the thing that catalyzes everything that comes afterwards. And so it's funny how they sow the seeds of their own destruction a little bit. Yeah. Oh, that's a whole other discussion, which is very interesting. I do want to uh, just uh, a another hearkening back to the actual school of Athens. You go back to, uh, um, you probably know of the philosopher Proclus, for instance. He was one of the last heads of the later school of Athens. And one of the things that he was really good at was procuring funding for his school. Uh, it was actually funded mostly off of patronage. Hmm. Um, and yes, it is coming from the uh, the well the well to do and the politically astute in in his own time. But it is a uh, you need this patronage, a sort of free giving to culture if it's going to be able to flourish properly, which is another really important aspect to our our foundation. Uh, but. Uh, well, we might be able to get more into that in the at the end of the conversation, uh, but it is an extremely important element for any sort of uh, real science, any sort of real investigation. Otherwise, you end up having yeah, you get sold out. Uh, monetary considerations end up ruling the day, which uh, seems like not just patronage, but like diverse patronage, right? Yeah. So if you're if your one patron is John D. Rockefeller or something like. He probably has a specific outcome that he wants from that. But everybody needs to be able to survive. You have to be able to, at the very least, keep a roof over your head and have enough for groceries and experiments. Borgias and the Medicis funded the Renaissance, right? <laughs> That's another aspect that really allowed the Renaissance to flourish is that you have these guys, they're being patronized by the church, they're being patronized by the bankers and the aristocracy of their own day. and we know that these guys weren't all that great, <laughs> like and on an individual level, but there still was this uh, desire uh, for something uh, good, even if that something good was going to uh, 
be injected back into their own city states or their own political aspirations. There is this recognition that I need to invest in the future. And I can't really tell these guys exactly how the future is going to come about because I don't really have that image. They do. Uh, This is what's really fascinating is we had our patron chat today and one of the guys at the patron chat brought up this study where the NIH had looked to see how grant funding impacted the production of publications and citations. And they discovered that the effect of getting what's called an R01 grant, which is this really big uh, early investigator grant that everybody chases after once they become a full professor. Sets you up for a few years. Sets you up for a few years. Had almost no effect on the production of publications. Publications that were cited. That were highly cited. And so it's the conclusion was that, oh man, we as a committee, as a group of peer-reviewed experts, don't actually have a sense of who to award money to in order to boost the likelihood that they're going to produce useful research. Yep. And so the a funding paradigm of some kind of patronage where it's just, you know what, you have an idea, you're creative, you're interested, go and build the future. I don't have preconceptions of what kind of projects I'm going to fund because I, I know what's going to happen. It's this humility of knowing that, well, the best thing that I can do is just fund a healthy ecosystem, which I, it seems like we've lost, but perhaps is possible to regain if the argument can be made that the healthy ecosystem is necessary. And so with this conversation about the cleavage of thought during the Renaissance or during the Enlightenment, I think the goal for me is to be able to make the case that there is a parallel track of science with different starting metaphysics that's actually just as valuable as the one that is currently the dominant paradigm. What's wrong with the dominant parody <laughs> paradigm? <laughs> uh, somebody's yeah. got to say it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what's wrong with it? I mean, I, I have thoughts, but let me hear you guys' thoughts first. Yeah, Austin, go <laughs> I for it. I can't ask the question and answer it. Um, so yeah, going, going off of that, I... You know, what we call the dominant paradigm today, it takes a long time for it really to uh, assert its dominance. And that doesn't really, in my view, really happen until about the middle of the 19th century. Uh, because these two streams, if you want to call them that, I see as really interweaving amongst each other all the way up until, up until that time. Uh, you're, you have main, mainstays of culture, for instance, of science, of philosophy that are integral to this whole development of what you might call a complementary scientific direction. Um, and we had a, a poster at our conference that was these two streams of science, right? And one at the very beginning is Galileo, which no one would really argue that Galileo is critical for the scientific revolution, but in how we're trying to point out these two polar ways of thinking, we actually place Galileo on this alternative stream of thought. Um, and what comes becomes the dominant, uh, you know, the dominant paradigm is more or less initiated by Francis Bacon. And you have here a, this thought from Bacon is like, I, I'm going to take my own idea. I'm going to come to an idea and I'm going to be able to basically force nature into the mold of my own idea. Um, I'm going to pick and I'm going to figure out, I'm going to lay out a bunch of experiments to be able to show the validity of how I'm thinking about things. Right. Whereas when you look at Galileo, he's not really giving a theory of anything. He's just really, he's studying motion, falling bodies. And he's just describing their activity. Uh, it isn't until Newton where you end up getting, you know, actual abstract ideas and equations for classical mechanics. Before this, it's pr- relative, it's accurate, but it's just descriptive. Uh, and this, th- this difference is really going to play itself out again and again and again and again as you move forward in the development of our modern world. Um, when you go next from the scientific revolution to 
transitioning over to the Enlightenment. You're again, you're getting into say Newton, uh, Rene Descartes, and maybe Leibniz, for instance, will be three main figures. You could even maybe throw Spinoza in there as well. Um, now, for the development of what we're calling the this alternative or complementary scientific direction, Leibniz is key. Like the whole development of German idealism and getting into, uh, say, Goethe's ideas on optics, on color, they're really they're really looking back to Leibniz, and a lot of these guys are even looking back to a guy by the name of Jacob Boma, um, who they end up crediting with the founding of modern uh, modern German philosophy. Uh, they claim him, they call him the first, the first German philosopher. And he's, I don't know if I can really include him in this scientific development, but uh, definitely coming out of, out of left field for people who are really considering science seriously and would consider themselves naturalists kind of through and through. Um, so it, when you look at Rene Descartes, I kind of find him an interesting point to jump off from this, to show this transition from the scientific revolution to the enlightenment and into what would become like romanticism and idealism. Uh, he, he's really critical for the development of what you'd call the modern scientific paradigm, the Cartesian coordinate system, all this stuff. But also for modern philosophy, like a lot of people look at him as the the birth of modern philosophy and this self-reflecting thought of, I think, therefore I am, right? He's trying to base a, he's trying to base his investigations on the world and something solid and this solid certainty, thing, certainty. Yeah. He finds in himself, right? Uh, the certainty for knowledge is I that I exist. Uh, and then I can elaborate something, elaborate something for, from there. Uh, now this is really critical to point out like this whole modern way of thinking is able to have an, a very certain relationship to physical things outside, but it also has a rather intensified self-consciousness. Like I, we are able to come to uh, very clear ideas about ourselves and elaborate our own thoughts and ideas in a way that wasn't possible prior. You look into history and you just don't have this sort of uh, desire to elaborate an understanding of the world out of our own individual human experience. Uh, it comes from God or somewhere else, right? Uh, now, as you're moving forward into German idealism, you oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I want to I want to pause you for a second because what okay. I want is I want to have the arc that we're traveling along in my mind first. Yeah, and so we have a we have a bunch of moving pieces. We have Galileo who has this descriptive model of nature where he's not really theorizing; he's just collecting ideas and observations cataloging Catalo them. yeah cataloging his observations then we have also this other thread of Newton and Descartes who are much more focused on theorizing and the the end point of these two diverging arcs you said ends in the middle of the 20th century and so yeah. give us a sense of or middle of the 19th Middle of the 19th, sorry, middle of the 19th. So give us a sense of where the, what that divergence looks like at the end okay. so that we can actually trace the path of what the evolution looks like. I mean, can I just, I, I, I feel bad if I don't say this, but sure. I feel like what Newton's doing is not really theorizing so much as summarizing the observations into these mathematical patterns. I understand that mathematicians, sorry, mathematical physicists call equations theories, but I don't think that's really fair. Like you, you don't have a conspiracy theory that's an equation, right? You, you don't have a theory of a lost civilization that's an equation. Like a theory has to be 
conceptual in some sense. And Newton shied famously away from giving any kind of explanatory uh, picture of gravity, for instance, right? He didn't really give a theory of gravity. It's just a mathematical statement of the way that things act in gravitational systems. So I think that that's totally... Had to say it. Oh, I, th- say I think it. that that's important. I think that that's important. And I don't want it to fall away from the discussion because it's like, there... Oh, go ahead. I just, I just see the like distinction as Bacon, um, like what Austin said, Bacon has this theory ahead of time, whatever, you know, he has a a vision of how something works. And then he develops this thing we call hypothesis testing, which is really, I think what Austin astutely pointed out is that hypothesis testing often amounts to designing a demonstration of your theory and how it plays out. And it's in accordance with the way that nature behaves under these various situations, right? You like take a model organism or whatever it is, and you show that your theory makes sense under these conditions and therefore uh, it's at least a possible explanation. It might not be the explanation, but by virtue of the fact that you could construct an experiment that shows it reproducibly, it it it's possible, reasonable, and then it gets extrapolated outwards to being the only explanation. But you're making the case that all that you're really doing is showing that inside your system it's working. I just don't think that the it's often passed off to really naive intro science students that you know we're constantly trying to test our ideas and so forth and it's not really how it plays out at the end of the day but maybe we'll get into that a bit later because the reality of the situation is that plenty of quote-unquote theories have been falsified over and over again but the result is not that the theory gets tossed out like you learn in intro science class the result is that a new alpha parameter gets tacked on or something right and i think that it's really Interesting because Newton clearly acts as the genesis of some tradition of thought. I I think nobody can argue with that. Mathematical physics. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And so, okay, so you have this tradition of thought that culminates in mathematical physics that begins with Newton and the, the specifics of what Newton's approach to the question is are probably worth like debating and laying out once we get the finer points of this arc down because i think that that's what's interesting here is the like the big arc and then figuring out if we can really like tease apart who I might owns. be able to describe the arc uh, by going into this a little bit more so you have classical mechanics right and this physical way these uh this mathematical way of dealing with mechanics now, that's one line, which is really, in a certain sense, just an elaboration of all of the observations of Galileo. You're just giving the mathematical form. And as long as his observations are correct, your, uh, your, your math is going gonna, is gonna to work. Um, there's another thing that Newton does, which is more theorizing. He tries to apply these mechanics to celestial observations, which is a theory. Uh, you're trying to give an explanation as to why you see the motions that you do based upon a, a assumption that the gravity, the way it operates here, operates the same way up there. Same explanation for both phenomena, which are at the outset very different phenomena, at least from the individual human experience, right? It's a pretty big leap logically. We make it every day now because we're so accustomed to it, but it's a pretty big one. Um, And then another important thing for Newton is, I mean, he kicks off the whole modern way of dealing with optics, right? And here again, we have a theory that he he has this idea of how light breaks apart, and he sets about to show it. And he sets up a very specific experiment. He sets the, the standard, if you will, with the experimentum crucis for showing the validity of an idea. Uh, and you might be able to say that overall, this is still relatively early on in the development of our, our scientific, uh, institutions and everything. So there is still a little bit of an element that hasn't totally gone off the rails. So at the outset, you could say that, yeah, he's still, when he's dealing with Galileo's stuff is somewhat true to the facts, but there are these two opposite directions which kind of go inside the human being 
in a certain respect because you're dealing with light, how we perceive things, and then all the way up and out. So when we're dealing with this solid material stuff, it's still more or less okay because he's imagining things in terms of basically billiard balls. And he wants to apply this billiard ball thought process, this idea of dealing with tangible stuff to everything, uh, which may or may not really be useful. You can show it to be useful in maybe specific circumstances, but does it apply to everything? And that's really where you end up having Goethe coming in with his color theory and his way of doing experiments, which isn't isolated to one particular viewpoint. He ends up elaborating a whole array of experiments to be able to show like, okay, well, this image of light breaking apart into these different colors, I can show a number of different experiments that really quite concretely proves that at least the way Newton was thinking about it can't possibly be. Um, the, you know, the, the Pink Floyd image, right, of the, the spectrum, it's an illusion. It's not really what happens because all of the colors, for instance, don't come out immediately, you know, right outside. You, you said uh, you've got your prism here. You've got uh, a, uh, a screen here. You don't have all the colors immediately. You have to move this screen farther and farther away to at least like right here before you have the whole spread of colors. Green doesn't arise until much later in this, in this spread. Uh, and another thing, he's putting in light. You can turn it inside out where you end up actually having more of a beam of shadow, if you will, a beam of darkness going through a prism, and you end up getting a completely different spread of colors. They're completely inverted. Uh, this is the have, Gothian spectrum? Yeah, yeah, or the complementary complementary spectra, as they call it. Um, and one of the main problems that you get into here that is, you know, the problem of magenta, for instance. It's like, okay, well, when we use our mathematical way of dealing with the phenomena, we say that green and magenta have the same wavelength. Thus, in magenta, the thought is, must be an illusion produced by our organism. Um, but at the outset, even just right there, you're privileging one particular experiment over another. What's not to say that magenta is the real color and green's the illusion, you know? <laughs> uh, which, one's, which one's primary? Uh, and as you develop that whole thought, Goethe's not really pointing to one or the other being primary. He's just trying to, again, show the whole spread of relationships. And it's this, and it's really right at about this point in time that you end up having this, uh, the dominance of m a mathematical way of dealing with physics, really cementing its dominance as the main paradigm. Uh, and, oh, yeah, excellent. There you go. Thank you. Um, and, so, and, and so what are, what are we looking at here really quickly? This is, so uh, up top, um, you actually know for both of them, you, this is just the traditional experiment of, uh, it's the experimentum crucis turned inside out. So you have these three different lines, these dotted lines, imagine those are screens that are placed to be able to have a view of these different colors that you're seeing head on here at the bottom. And as you move the screen farther away you get different bands of colors. And these bands ha are really the origin of why we call it, you know, a particular wavelength or something. It's like this angular distribution. Of, this of this is the shadow though, right? That's being this reflected. This is the shadow, yeah. So you end up having, you have a light room over here, and then over here you have the prism, and you end up having like, uh, say you've got a bunch of blinds, right? And you have the light coming through the window and a beam of this shadow is what actually goes through the prism instead of the light. And as the shadow ends up going through the prism and ends up getting projected onto a screen in the light room, you get this uh, spread of colors, which are yellow, magenta, or uh, cyan, or light blue. Um, the... Which is freaking crazy because people don't usually think about shadows as containing any energy in them for light. Yeah, 
And what's also super crazy, you know, what you can do with this, you, you have the traditional spectra and you end up having infrared, right? Not visible light. It ends up heating stuff up. If you do this with shadow and you get your uh, infra cyan, if you will, it ends up giving you, it makes things colder. No. Yeah, so this was this was one of the craziest things at the conference. So what somebody did is they showed a chart of infrared intent of, of heating, basically. Intensity using like a, a photo a, a, a photo sensor. And so as you move it across the Newtonian spectrum, the places where it's white or or you know, I cannot reproduce the figure in my mind right now. But basically the intensity of light as you move it across this shadow spectrum goes down and then recovers after you leave the spectrum. So white light is hotter than these shadow colors by the measurement of the infrared detector. That makes sense. They should, yeah. It's, I mean, that seems pretty conventional. It, 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 but it brings, the point is that what she's trying to say is that it brings down, if like if you have a datum, Light is going to bring it up, our normal colors, and these other colors are going to bring it down. So you have a, a cooling effect and mm, a heating effect. Mm, mm. By yeah. the individual shadow colors. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's really the, the core idea of Goethe's way of looking at color, is that you have a polarity of light and darkness. And what produces colors is this interaction of light and darkness. Not that darkness is just some absence. It's a real thing. It has tangible qualities and it has physical, uh, has physical effects, not just psychological effects. Um, and trying to deal with that as a reality as a whole. Now, as we know, that's not how we generally think about things. And one of the things that's really important, you're trying, you asked me to give this whole picture, this whole arc, you know, you've got the tr normal history, you've got the sign, uh, you have the Renaissance, the scientific revolution, you have the enlightenment, you have its uh, reactions in the various forms of romanticism, idealism, but, or, and if you look into America at later at around this point in time, you have American transcendentalism. These are all considered main stream cultural currents, right? You might consider like they are interweaving with this whole scientific development and the ideas of one school and another are actually fructifying one another. They're not really, it, it is in the struggle between these two that we actually come to all of the developments in thought and in technique that we have today. It takes both of these uh, to really be able to produce something worthwhile. And you end up having right at about this time, you have Darwin coming in the whole materialistic cosmological picture really becomes cemented in people's minds. And this other stream ends up beca basically becoming what becomes the mainstream is this mechanical way of dealing with the world. And anything else becomes a fringe idea. It becomes, in our modern parlance, a pseudoscience. Uh, regardless of whether it's just as solid whether it rests on just as solid a scientific basis as any other any other way of looking at things all right can we hold on for one second because I'm, I'm having trouble with a couple of things yeah um modern physics is so far from mechanical right now that's that's one thing that pops out at me uh the other thing uh so there's two thoughts that i'd love to hear hear you respond to uh the other one is that newton was very much involved in the occult and this humanistic, spiritual, uh, what would you say, metaphorical, symbolic interpretation of reality as well. Mm -hmm. Does that get kind of squeezed out? Or, or is that does that thread continue up to the present somewhere and we just can't see it? So... I mean, that's a, it's a good question. I would also say that his way of dealing with the occult is marked by this whole, uh, the way he thinks about physics and the way he thinks about science is also makes a polar differentiation between how he deals with occult things as well. Um, you go all the way back to Francis Bacon. I mean, if you want to get down 
and uh, the conspiratorial realm of things. You got Francis Bacon and John D and the magic and 007 and all spies and everything, right? It's all it's all there together. Um, we're trying to simplify that picture a little bit, but yeah, it all it is all inter interwoven. Um, but even there, you it's a, the way of dealing with these things. It's the actual way of thinking and when I point out to a very mechanical way of thinking, say in the middle of the 19th century, at that point in time, these new developments that you're referring to hadn't really come about yet in what we call call modern physics. It takes really the beginning of the 20th century where all hell breaks loose, basically in a social scientific like sense, everything, everything goes. Do you think is that, is that a direct reaction to people trying to force the, spirit like the non-physical out of science and and then they just it just the dam breaks at some points i mean i'm not trying to get things completely out of order here but it does seem like we're we'll get far to that yeah okay let's Actually, get to that. yeah one of the characters i want to talk about at the end really his whole philosophy tries to point out like if you're a hardcore materialist or if you're a hardcore idealist you need the other uh because you know the <laughs> yeah we'll get into that as we as we keep moving forward but I think that the frame in which we tend to think about the Newtonian paradigm is less uh, of a mechanical one and more of a mathematical one, where it's like parameterization and equations and... Predictive power. A predictive power becomes really, really, really important. And what falls away is this holistic theorizing about what it means and where it where the math comes being from. too so i'll turn that on you and ask yeah it's mathematical but what is it used for it it's used for mechanical engineering predominantly like it, it's used in a very technical and mechanical sense we are able to take hold of using these ideas we're able to very effectively take hold of mechanical forces and direct them to our will. It's really funny because we have a couple of friends that are engineers. We actually have a bunch of friends that are engineers from like donut plant operators to people building train lines to like next generation computer chips. And across the board, every single engineer is like, we use a really tiny fraction of the equations that are out there and have such a narrow scope of practice that nobody really understands what the hell is happening. We just inherit a list of equations that we use for each situation. And so it's like there's a subset of the equations that are developed in this mathematical physics world, which I think can be traced pretty neatly back to Newton, where he's like, hypothesis non fingo. I have no theory of, I have no hypothesis for what gravity is. I just have this equation. And everybody kind of is just like, okay, I guess that's good enough. And so they keep doing the equation thing. And the engineers today aren't using the totality of the equations. Like the the equation for the Hubble constant or the the expansion of the universe or whatever else is not a, is not a uh, engineering equation per se. It's just the limit of inquiry. And so I get what you're saying about there being this mechanical application. And so it's mechanical in the sense that we have a narrow progression of sense, science to engineering. In the sense that it isn't spiritual either, right? It's not, there's, like people who are really good at wielding mathematical physics have no idea how to explain to you the best way to live your life or something like that. Like there's no contextual humanized side of that art form from what I can tell. Like particle colliders aren't designed to make the world a better place. Mathematical physics equations uh, cause, like even the idea, like cosmology being a purely mathematical institution is very bizarre because cosmology, as defined for thousands of years, was about putting humans in the context of everything else. It's a very like. Ooh. Go ahead. <laughs> jump in there. So, so maybe try to help elucidate what it is that I'm saying. Um, there are limitate like calculating to come to an idea uh, a valid way of looking at the world i'm essentially calling mechanical um and the reason why that is uh, being a biologist for instance 
if you're going to get in and you're going to try to calculate exactly organic forms, can you calculate for me in a way that allows you to be able to give me a very uh, strict idea of one particular species in all of its different variations? And what I, the, you end up running into a problem is because there's sort of an infinite variability that arises when you begin to deal with organisms. And also, this is something that, like, say, Kepler ran into and is a real problem, is if you look up at the stars, a lot of these things are incommensurable in this respect as well. Like, you have, uh, you can't come to a final definite uh, solution or the, <laughs> the decimals keep going. Um, the, you have irrational, <laughs> you have irrational results. And this requires like the actual calculating mind at that point should recognize that, all right, I've come to a limit as to what my calculations can do. This particular kind of thinking here reaches its limit and I need to be able to transform it in some way to actually deal with what I'm looking at. Uh, and that's, that's what I mean by we have a dominant paradigm of mechanical science is because it is in like this mechanic, like this abstract thinking, this way of dealing with things in terms of equations and applying them to the world is, is this thought process. Is that, is that yeah, I, yeah. I, th I think I just I worry about the use of the word mechanical in that, but I understand what you're saying, and I think you're pointing at this uh, this mathematical approach to nature, which you know has its utility certainly in engineering, but the question about whether it can explain nature to us in any capacity, whether math itself has any explanatory power, is a whole open question as far as I'm concerned. It's almost so maybe, like an abacus using, approach. If I'm using mechanical, maybe just take it in the sense that I'm trying to make a nod to where these eyes, these ideas were developed from. Like they're developed in dealing with mechanical forces. Uh, and that we shouldn't forget that fact. Because if we're trying to take a look at the whole of our reality again, like we can't abstract our equations from what they were developed initially to deal with. Which is why for, I think that I, I'm filing it in my brain not as not as purely mechanical, but more like mechanical calculator, like abacus. It's this thing of counting. It's this process of keeping track of 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 objects that we need to be able to bin in order to be able to relate them to one another. And we're happy to cut the tails of the distribution off because it's so messy that it can't actually fit into the box. And so it's this process of, of shellacking the surface of the world to make it manageable and boxable. Is that, yes. do you think, a fair Box. assessment? Okay. What's yeah. the alternative, by the way? So is there another stream developing in parallel behind yeah. the curtain? Yeah, or even in even in front of the curtain. That's what I'm trying to point out is that up until the middle of the 19th century, like it is actually a mainstream of culture. If you take a look at these guys' ideas, Goethe's uh, theory of color, his studies in metamorphosis, plant metamorphosis, laying the foundation really for the study of animal morphology. Like none of this, he's trying to develop a way of thinking that is as exact as mathematical astronomical calculation but is not r limited in the same in the same way uh and this is a a mainstay all the way throughout you know an exact way of thinking that is not boxed into just shut up and calculate what's an example can you give can you paint an example of an attempt at doing something that's not shut up and calculate in Goethe's canon or anything like that from the past just so people have a, an example of what that alternative might look like um so i mean you've got his whole color theory again where uh, we ended up showing you you pulled up a picture the normal experimentum crucis of newton has one uh, one screen at one distance dark side um, of the moon huh dark side of the moon pink floyd the, the, yeah uh, yeah, yeah. 
Um, and when this is this image that you pulled up for Goethe is literally just one one kind of experiment with a number of different variations in terms of distance for this one experiment. But he ends up trying to take a look at, at how colors arise also in their physiological responses, like the after images, all of this kind of stuff ends up playing into how he thinks about color from the ground up. He ends up taking a look out at the sky and has a clear explanation in his way of thinking as for why the sky is blue. It's, you end up, uh, one of the other things he used was called, uh, what he called was like opalescent stones, like a turbid medium, like a cloudy substance. If you end up having a, one of these opalescent stones and you put it on a white piece of paper, then when you look through the opalescent stone with light going through it, it looks kind of yellowish. But if you end up pulling it over and you have another black piece of paper, the, you end up seeing that, oh, when I look through this opalescent stone in a black background, the thing looks blue, right? So what are all of the different varying conditions? What are the laws that give rise to these colors? And can I use real world situations to be able to give you a complete coherent way of thinking about a phenomena that doesn't have to reduce it to, oh, okay, I now take a prism, I end up getting a spread of colors, I then end up measuring the bands of these colors, and I then thereby come to a way of giving a numerical value to a particular color, and thereby I have my real explanation for what it is, um, whether it's a corpuscular nature of light or it's a wave theory of light, whatever it is, that it's a certain amount, a certain quantity of some things. Uh, these are two different ways of trying to deal with the phenomena. You can deal with the phenomena as such and have the phenomena into all of its variations actually allow you to have the idea arise in your mind as to exactly what it is, how it operates, the principles that underlie it, instead of trying to come to it through an equation. I'm trying to figure out a way to summarize this difference. It's the idea that instead of taking an experiment and cutting away all of the weird conditions and the strangenesses, is that you take the heart of it that shows the thing that you want to measure or demonstrate and present just that and s the newtonian experimental experimentum crucis is just that it is the light through the prism in the darkness at a specific distance that gives you the spread and it's presented in a way to make you think that that's the only thing that happens when you put light through a prism while the gothian approach appears to be no, hold on a second. There's this process of selecting the way that you look at a system that gives you radically different responses. And in order to really understand the system, you have to spend a long time in contemplation of all of the different aspects of it so that you can say something cohesive and maximally true, maybe, and which also, may be less useful for engineering, which is right because. The maybe, engineering maybe thing, if you can measure the wavelength of light and then you can go forward and you can say, okay, well, we can, it leads eventually to a laser or a diode or something else, right? Like these are things that give you these really particular engineering outcomes. They become and, useful. And the Gothian approach seems to be more useful on the spiritual level of saying like, examine your interaction with the system. It, no, in a certain sense, but it also opens up a, it can it can be useful yeah in in engineering senses as well it's just that when you immediately apply the useful mentality at the outset like i'm looking for a particular result a particular outcome it sort of shuts off the the real scientific inquiry and you get a very particular line of thought that develops from that let me actually let me read you two different quotes that was on the two streams mm. uh, i think one is Goethe's quote the second is Francis Bacon's. So, like, maybe that'll end up complementing what you what you just said, which is very accurate. Um, but just to kind of flesh that out a little bit more. So, from Goethe, we cannot take great enough care when making inferences based on experiments. 
We should not try through experiments to directly prove something or to confirm a theory. For at this pass, the transition from experience to judgment, from knowledge to application, lie and wait all our inner enemies, imaginative powers that lift us on their wings into heights while letting us believe we have our feet firmly on the ground, impatience, haste, self-satisfaction, rigidity, thought forms, preconceived opinions, lassitude, frivolity, and fickleness. This horde and all of its followers lie in ambush and suddenly attack both the active observer and the quiet one, who seems so well secured against all passions. And then you end up having Francis Bacon's here. There remains but one course for the recovery of a sound and healthy condition, namely that the entire work of the understanding be commenced afresh, and the mind itself be from the very outset not left to take its own course, but guided at every step, and the business be done as if by machinery. So, you end up having a result of thinking about things as if I need to take hold of my own idea and uh, basically pound it forward as if by machinery, as opposed to all right, well, I recognize that I have all of these shortcomings and to be able to overcome any of these, to come to any sort of true view of any phenomena, I need to really be patient and uh, elaborate the the thing in as many different ways as I can before I try to form a judgment. You know, where I've seen this a lot is when people, at least in, in like I work in astronomy right now at the university and a lot of times I'll hear or I'll read statements by scientists where they're like X, Y, and Z phenomena occurred. And we like, they'll say, let me just give an example. Like the clocks on earth go uh, slower than clocks in orbit because of what general relativity tells us. Well, the, that's kind of bullshit because the, the clocks go slower, faster because they do. And there's a mechanism probably available for why they do. The mathematical equation called general relativity, which tells you the quantitative relationship between those clocks and their distances and so forth, it's not causing the clocks to act that way. But so often do I hear this works this way because general relativity. This works the way it does because of special relativity or because of X, Y, and, or because of evolution. That's another one in biology all the time. Because of evolution. It's like, that's just, that, that's a really circular way of approaching nature. And I think that's what uh, Goethe is honing in on and, re and in some sense aligning himself away from. Because attributing your idea to the cause of the phenomena is the danger that you run into with the other approach. Precisely. Yeah. Uh, that's a good real world example for what we deal with. Um, and, and you hear it all the time today. Yeah, you, you do. And I mean, some of the, there's two guys that I want to get into um, before we end, end the, the whole talk. And one of them uh, is Larson. I at least want to kind of touch on why he's important to this whole, whole line of uh, development. And when you read his his stuff, it's almost like he's just what you've just indicated. He gets so fed up <laughs> with this uh, this like this presumption that the idea that we have in our minds is actually a real thing. Like we end up taking our idea as a reality, and then he's like, "No, no, 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 no!" Like you can't do that. Uh, that's not. That's not. At least that's not science as how he thinks science is, um, even though that that is very much how a lot of these, uh, a whole a whole line of scientific development has carried itself out, is not particularly philosophically speaking, very accurate. Like it ends up because they're so concerned with one particular line of development, they end up running into a lot of these logical problems, a lot of epistemological problems, because they just haven't studied how to think. <laughs> so they end up producing sometimes very useful inventions and ways of thinking about things, but not necessarily 
something that is beneficial for actually trying to keep our scientific development moving forward. Mm -hmm. It's just inherently self-limiting, right? It's like, it's kind of relates to the stagnation process that we were talking about. Uh, we were talking around it with NIH earlier, but this idea that, you know, our methods have gotten us so far, but it's very restrictive at this point. And honestly, there's, I think that it is an intuitive level too, where a lot of people who in the past would have gone and done scientific studies, like these characters we're reading about from the deep past, I don't know that they would feel very at home in the academy today, right? Mm. It's like, are those types of people like Huygens or uh, Gorta, like, are they going to really want to sit around and dig through DOE grants and try and like sh hammer their, shoehorn their ideas into something that pays the bills and then, you know, serve on graduate committee? Like, I just feel like we've kind of, in our modern society, pushed those types of thinkers out of the way in some sense. Maybe they end up going into finance now or like some some easier way that they can make money while preserving time to study the things or do the things that they like to do. But it's just a very inhospitable climate in the academy for out-of-the-box thinkers. And that's actually a really important insight. I, one of the things that I think also characterizes this whole stream that I'm trying to point to because it ends up dealing with the whole of human life. It is able to clearly recognize that if we have a way of thinking, which is inherently self-limiting and we end up applying this as a whole sort of cosmological perspective, we end up, it ends up influencing how we build our social systems. It ends up thinking how influencing how we think about ourselves, society, and is able to actually cause real social ills. Uh, like I, one of the things that was at the core of why we thought there needed a renewal of science and why we did the conference that we did is because we, when we take a look at everything that's going on in the world, like we, we don't really have at least in the dominant paradigm, any sort of real answers for things. It's sort of like, w as long as we keep chugging away at this and we end up, we'll come to new scientific discoveries, we'll come to new technological achievements that'll help us solve our environmental problems. Or will, if we just keep plugging along with our democratic process, eventually reason will prevail. You know, this whole sort of way of, business as usual in the status quo can just end up solving our problems. Um, but we need some other, we need some other way forward that's actually able to take culture and society as a whole and really to be able to conceive of the human being in a comprehensive way with its whole surroundings. Uh, we can't have a science which basically at the end of the day declares human identity to be an illusion and expect to be able to solve human problems. <laughs> you know, we are, our normal way of thinking about a human being is like, okay, well, it's this assemblage of particles that uh, has all these chemical relationships and ends up producing a biological organism of some form. You have all of these social dynamics, uh, psychic, a uh, psychological phenomenon. Um, and the human being is thought of as a uh, as a sum <laughs> of all of these pieces, and thus what we experience as our own individuality is explained on the basis of a whole plethora of external multiplicities. Uh, there's like qualitatively <laughs> like a significant difference here that is just kind of overlooked, and at the core, I think it's why we have so many uh yeah so many ills that are associated with this whole line of thought like if you end up taking a look at the industrial production that comes out of the mechanical capacities whether it's uh the early industrial factories or if it's our modern digital world you end up uh, you you have these sort of dystopian nightmares that look back at you in the face and 
it it should teach you something, right? <laughs> like that's the outcome of this whole process. Like what did we get wrong? Uh, so what happened in the mid 1800s? Cause you pointed to that as being the moment where things took a turn for the worse. Yeah. So you end up having in this whole parallel development, you have ideas that are cultivated philosophically speaking, aesthetically speaking, scientifically speaking, that are able to really deal with the human being and the world in a way that is sufficient, at least on an individual basis. But the problem is, is that all of these developments weren't really going into social institutions and systems. So you end up having this way of thinking basically stamped out from a, not from within science itself, but from all of the external factors that allow scientists to do what they do. Uh, broader social concerns, I mean, if you're looking at the middle of the 19th century, you have all of the, all the revolutions in Europe going on at that point in time. Uh, you've got uh really what begins to lay the foundations for world war one like going on like there's a lot of really not so pretty stuff that's going on at the same time as you have this entrenching of a whether it's a, a darwinian way of thinking of the coming into being of man or just a mechanical elaboration of, well, at the end of it all, as long as we're able to explain the particle interactions, we'll be able to explain everything. Like this, this dream of science, it really not only takes hold as an idea, but also begins to be funded and pushed. It also seems to be supplanting a religious take on the cosmos at the same time, right? Like people are having less and less tolerance for the fairy tale version of reality that they're getting from the church. But I think as they become more and more, as you would say, mechanical, mechanically minded or, or mathematically minded, rationally, let's say, logical, uh, they start to have a hard time not looking at the classical mythology that they're handed down from the church as being symbolic. And they start looking at it with this empirical skepticism right like wait a second you're telling me that this mary lady had a baby without ever hooking up with a dude like i don't think that makes sense therefore everything else you're saying doesn't make sense and i'm out of here and then the question becomes like can people get by without some sort of symbolic mythopoetic view of the world yeah. that they celebrate together once a week like not Is only it? that, but how does that fit in with a scientific conception of the world in the way that we currently treat science, which is this thing that is instrumental in improving our quality of life and our ability to get things done. And yeah. so it's like, how, because we, we seem to start with the Renaissance as being this place where the foment of art and philosophy and proto-science are intertwined with a spiritual perspective of nature, the divinity of man, the divinity of the cosmos, as all being this, this place from which ideas emerge. That seems to go, you, and you're pointing to the mid-1800s as the place where this kind of starts to go away or finally coalesces into having gone away. Is yeah, it you have the differentiation of from the Renaissance up to this point of the differentiation of three aspects of culture, the scientific, the artistic, and the religious. They're gradually becoming independent of one another to the point in the mid 19th century, which in a certain sense you begin to see them become actually dissociated. Like you can't be an artist and a scientist. You can't be religiously inclined and pursue science through your religious inclination. Um, you might be able to say that there's still this connection in a certain sense between the religious inclination and 
the artistic inclination, but even there, you, but Christian starts- rock's kind of terrible. Let's be honest. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, they, all of these things begin to be pulled apart. Um, and if you're looking into at the broader society, you've got, you've got your three aspects of society. You've got your cultural aspects, your economic aspects and your political aspects and your political and your economic ones are basically starting to impinge themselves onto the cultural development in such a way that the cultural development isn't able to actually continue forward on its own terms and has to be uh, the culture becomes a use instead of something that is for its own ends. Mm, can you uh, can you elaborate on that? I don't totally. Social engineering. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, yeah. so and but surely social engineering begins in the mid eighteen hundreds, or you think that that's no, just I, like modern coalescing of it? Yeah, like it be the way that we, if you look at it, it's like yeah, you can end up projecting societal engineering all the way back to ancient Egypt if you want. Um, like we're you have a way of thinking about the world uh, that the leaders of civilization end up sort of making, uh, creating the pathways for cultures to continue to develop. But this whole way of actually this thought process of I can engineer a society, right? That I can have my own idea as to how society should be. And I can then impose it on society. I can force it on it. Um, this like you have the independence of our own we started as like with the modern capacity of consciousness right like the individual consciousness of human beings becomes strong enough to begin to impose its will not only on nature but also on the rest of man like you can have in like ideas that are coming from people that are actually produced by people and not some reference to something outside is you when you're looking back to the impulses that gave rise to earlier civilizations there's still something outside of man regardless of whether you want to say that things good or bad an illusion whatever like that's at least the thought that is in people um that's how it's coming to be expressed at the very least and that's no longer the case at this point in time so it's also tied deeply into the industrial revolution then, right it's the idea that man has finally conquered nature and is no longer bound by the rules of nature, and so doesn't need to look to nature in order to find inspiration or meaning because, well, we have become gods. So why look outwards? Is that kind of the... The gist. Okay. Hey, pardon the interruption. I just need to remind you that this program is entirely supported by listeners, and you can do that by coming over to patreon.com slash demystifiedsci and giving just a couple dollars a month or a wheelbarrow full of dollars a month, whatever you can afford to help us power our own growth and exploration and put more and more time towards this project. So see you over at patreon.com slash demystifiedsci. There's two things, and I don't know if we want to like close one down and take on the other or, or vice versa, but there's two pieces here. So there's this bifurcation. One is the Baconian approach of, I think I know how this natural system works. I'm going to encapsulate it in a series of demonstrations that I'll call an experiment, and that will prove that my idea is true, and then we'll operate on these assumptions and their descriptions, their mathematical descriptions, whatever, going forward. The other is we're going to look at nature as this infinitely complex beast that the more we look at it, the more we learn and the wider our theoretical perspective can become. And we don't lean on our theories as if they are reality. And instead we use the theories to kind of summarize what we've learned so far about things. So there's these two routes. And obviously we have the dominance in the engineering world, the engineering driven society that we live in, the technological society, the science is dominated by the former. There's also this aspect of the splitting, the bifurcation of spiritual humanist approaches to nature and philosophy and cosmology with this more instrumentalized, uh, heads-down technological approach. That seems to have been breaking off around the same time, perhaps. So you have those those two different bifurcations. Maybe they're part of the same one. I can't, I'm not quite there yet. 
Yeah. That's what I've learned so far. <laughs> That's yeah. where I'm at. Um, I I think that your description of the more holistic scientific approach holds within it why uh, basically the connection of both of these intersections, right? So on the one hand, you're it's not you could say that it is all right. Well, we're coming to know more and more and more through all of these various modes of experimentation, and we're but one of the critical things is in this whole line of thought is that there isn't this sort of Kantian approach to, oh, well, I'm going to have better and better and better approximations of what the world outside of me actually is. So there's this intimate, like the way they conceive of knowing more or less consciously, depending upon the whole time stream of what we're talking about and who you're talking about, but more or less consciously is recognizing that I'm actually essentially uniting myself with the phenomena outside of me in knowledge. Um, and that this is that knowledge itself is a spiritual activity. Uh, mm. That this thinking process, when I think about the world, it's not merely something that occurs in my own mind, but when done properly and going outside of just abstracting the world into a particular thought process, I actually live into the world and the world lives into me. Uh, which, Is that a stream that you're attributing to the Newton, or the Baconians or no, 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 no. Uh, the more good, the more Goethean one. Okay. Cause I was like, man, I, I guess I've like talked to a few scientists who kind of think like that, but I'm like, for the most part, no, that no, doesn't no. seem to, <laughs> okay, I got you. I got you. Yeah. Well, um, the, the entire project of mm, contemporary mainstream science is to be as objective as humanly possible and to remove the experiential viewer from it, yeah. which is to say that there is a privileged perspective from which you can look at something and say that it is so. And that's, that's like the, the whole sum of the project. It's to be able to reach truth. Every right. time you talk to a scientist, it's like, we're all about truth. We're seeking to understand the truths of the universe. And I'm like, how do you understand the truths of a universe where each time that you stand in a different place, it appears to change? Like, It's is, interesting, too, that the word truth has a quantitative legibility to it. Like, it makes a lot of sense in the context of logic gates, if-then statements, right? Mathematics is essentially this a logic, right, of quantita quant quantitation. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a quantitative logic, right? So that so the word truth, true and false, makes a lot of sense there. But when you get to nature and making statements about it, then it's like you're using natural language all of a sudden for the most part, or drawing movies or something. And there's details that are getting left out, so it's not the whole truth. It's just kind of it becomes an, a spin on the truth. It's the instrumentalist truth. Like we talked about this a little bit, where in the if, in the mid 1800s we can trace the real solidification of industrialization as like well this is just what we're going to do now and as a consequence of that you have the rise also of what's called scientific management where right around the turn of the 20th century it became insanely popular to break down assembly line work into the units of time that it takes to perform a single action and then to optimize production on the basis of how much time it takes each worker to perform the action on the basis of this idealized time frame. So we start to see this idea that science is a maximalization of some kind of instrumentalized efficiency. Just because even the idea that that would be called scientific management tells you that the way that we're thinking about science is all about improving the bottom line, improving metrics, being able to make this next step forward. And so with that entrenchment comes a progressive narrowing of the way that we do our science. We have a couple of paradigms, a couple of veins that are able to be mined. And for a long time, they work. Right? Like we continue to see increases in agricultural yield. We continue to see improvements in communication technologies, uh, in medicine, 
all of these things, every single year that you look, appear to be getting Just better. Just don't look at the lifespan. Uh, so, th and this is what's crazy is that lifespan has actually been continuously increasing until maybe two or three years ago. Like there has never been a time since the mid 1800s that lifespan has not improved or increased until the last five years. And so what seems to have happened is that we found a paradigm that worked really well, cemented ourselves into it, forgot this practice of foment, forgot this practice of the different ideas. Expansionism. Expansionism and exploration. Like Kuhn kind of talks about this a little bit where he's talking about the idea of scientific revolutions where you have this period of pre-paradigmatic science where people are just kind of doing stuff and exploring. And this seems very Gothian in practice where you're, you're looking at color from all of these different perspectives and you're kind of exploring and figuring out what it might mean. The paradigm solidifies through this Newtonian action of saying, no, we place the screen here in order to achieve maximal utility. Everything that comes downstream of it will be mechanically implemented and very functional and we can just keep going with it. And so it seems like we've reached the end of the useful life of this paradigm that we grabbed a hold of in the mid 1800s. We're kicking a dead horse. Oh yeah, it just it's not it's exactly it, exactly. It's just not carrying us any farther. And so what does it look like to revive that other parallel line of thought when it's been gone for so long? Um, so ooh, I don't necessarily think it's gone. Okay. So at that point, I was in the middle of the 19th century. I'm trying to point to something that is sort of woven together as a mainstream culture, this sort of struggle between two opposites. And then you have something occurring where you have one sort of being thrown to the fringes, um, but it's still just as influential on everything that's going on, but it's just not what we call mainstream anymore, right? Uh, now, there's a, <clears throat> a period in time in which this is pulling itself apart, which is... There's a social phenomenon in Germany or in the German speaking world in the beginning of the 20th century that was referenced in our conference a couple of different times. And that's uh, anthroposophy, right? So one of the things that they were trying to accomplish was, again, this sort of reunification of all of these different aspects of cultural life and to be able to free it also from the economic constraints or the political motivations of the day. And they were relatively successful to this up to a point. So uh, even during the middle of the uh, World War I, you have people coming together from all over the broader European society, even sort of the, the Russian-speaking world, the Eastern Europeans. Um, and able, they were able to build a solid community, like a, a, a temple, quite literally. Um, in the middle of the tumult of World War One, So you're able to have a free cultural life. <laughs> uh, that is, you're creating an entire environment out of these wellsprings of your ideas in the middle of the destruction of the rest of the world at that point in time. So I see that as a success. I'm going to speak broadly speaking. Um, but after World War One. Th this momentum isn't able to carry itself forward more back into mainstream society. So this is something of a fringe movement at that point in time, but it's also uh, front and center enough that um, some of what's being worked out by Steiner and his contemporaries are almost get implemented as social uh, reconstructive rehabilitation after World War I. So if you had had the adoption of some of these uh, these ideas, social threefolding, a lot of these different things, a couple of different ways of thinking about economics, um, 
you wouldn't really have had World War II in the way that we did. So it's almost like a failure of all of these ideas that were able to cultivate themselves coherently within a social group, but were unable to necessarily reach out and affect the broader society in the immediate term. It might have been even worse. Like they might have impacted it in a negative sense because, you know, guys like Hitler come along and grab up a lot of this Christian esotericism that is in some sense centered by the Steiner camp. Like maybe it's worth actually like pointing out to people like exactly what this Steiner mythology circled around or like give some examples of that for people who have maybe not come across Steiner's lecture series or or anthroposophy in general. Probably. Just kind of give people a sense of what that is, maybe. So, I think out of the nature of the discussion we've had previously, I'll, I'll point out how anthroposophy ends up developing out of a out of German idealism. Most people, when they look if they have some idea of its history, point to its uh, its structural relationship to theosophy in the early days. Um, but it's pointed it out again and again that this isn't the case. That's not what Steiner is going for. He's very explicit about this. Uh, and he before he gets involved with these more occult movements uh, in a open social sense um, in the broader society, like he's giving lectures, any of this kind of stuff. He is really studying. He was the author of a uh, of the commentaries on Goethe's scientific works. He actually worked at the Goethe archives early on. He was like in his late 20s, early 30s. And he ends up writing a book, also Goethe's uh, theory of uh, knowledge or the theory of knowledge implicit in Goethe's world conception. So like his, the foundations for his approach to dealing with spiritual phenomena are very much intertwined with the whole development of uh, Goethean thought and German idealism, more broadly speaking. So his PhD thesis was really more focused on the interaction, say, between Fichte's way of looking at the individual and its application in a scientific sense and how this relates to Goethe's way of working with nature. Uh, and he, the full exposition of this, if you will, ends up coming out in a book called The Philosophy of Freedom. It's like 1897 or something like that, I think is when the first publication of that is. And it's not a... I mean, you're, it is being read by the broader, at least I should say, idealistic <laughs> currents of the time. You don't want to say that, you know, epistemology and hardcore moral philosophy are like mainstream, <laughs> but it is, uh, it, he's trying to penetrate into the university. He wants to have a lecture position uh, in the sense of uh, what, you know, uh, the son of uh, Fichte, for instance. You know, most people end up thinking that Steiner coins the term anthroposophy. It's historically incorrect. He doesn't do so. The act, the, this ends up coming out of some people that are quite directly, in even a biological sense, a continuation of German idealism. As the guy who's really thinking out at least what would need to be an anthroposophy is the son of Johann Gottlieb Fichte, right? like one of the main central German idealists. Um, and there's another guy, uh, it's like Emanuel Troxler or something like that. But these figures are working at the end of the end of the 19th century. And if I remember correctly, they're like actually at the institution that Steiner ends up actually getting his PhD from. I might, I might be uh, telling you wrong there, but I think there is a, a if I remember correctly, there's a connection. Um, so he's when you're dealing with idealism you're having you're having the struggle of trying to overcome the divide between the human being and the world and if you're going to have like kant for instance sets limits to knowledge 
It's in order to save human dignity, in a sense, he basically builds up this wall and says, well, everything that's inside here uh, works according to human laws and everything out there is kind of going on based upon the general scientific currents of his day, uh, the broader ones. Now, when you're dealing with the other idealists, they're struggling with this. Goethe was struggling with that. And it isn't really until Steiner, until you have a, actually like a full explication and a weaving together of everything that you're finding in German idealism. So when you look at this and the spiritual science that he ends up developing out of his epistemology, it is, people have described it who aren't even in the anthroposophical movement, if you want to call it that, as a German idealism that's come of age. Like it's a maturation, it's the fruit of German idealism. So if you're looking at... Which is yeah. why Hitler loved it so much. <laughs> 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 and why you've never heard of it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, there is something about that. I mean, I actually think of like all the things that Hitler destroyed in addition to human beings. Um, one of them is, is this kind of esoteric approach to nature. Another one is the ether, which is another one people don't know is, is a real ca uh, casualty of the Nazi regime. Uh, but... The uh, the Nazis started calling relativity the Jewish science, there you go. which rallied people around it, as opposed to being able to really freely pursue what was now a n not even a neo-Nazi. It was just a straight Nazi perspective that the ether was the way to go. But seriously, like, do you think that that's a reasonable part of the story for why we, these haven't made their their way into a mainstream conception? Yeah, you you actually. I mean, this gets more into the undercurrents of a lot of different things. But when you look at the early dissolution of the anthroposophical society and even um, the death of Rudolf Steiner, like there's, uh, there are, or the burning of their temple, <laughs> it was arson. Um, uh, the, uh, there's conjecture also that Steiner was poisoned. Um, he basically, his health just goes, um, and doesn't really survive. Uh, he dies in 1925 and I think the Goethe on him burns in like 1923. It's on Christmas Eve or something like that. Like it's over Christmas, the thing burns. Um, and it's, uh, legally was ascertained to be arson. Uh, so that you end up getting the money and you're able to end up building the new Guthe on them, which is a completely uh, a, a successor, if you will, but a very, very different construction. The dichotomy of temple and academy is really interesting to me because obviously universities are very much temple structures. Many of them are, have the same architecture as ancient Greek temples, things like that. But the way that it's been kind of removed from the language, I think, is indicative of the anti-spiritualist approach of this kind of cold calculating science that we've been left with. Yeah. Uh, just as a note, the center, so the both Gautianums, the center uh, piece of the building, its function is as a stage. So it's an auditorium and a stage, uh, both the first and the second Gautianum. And it is this uh, dichotomy <laughs> between a the material uh, world around you and the uh, spiritual inspiration that is being performed on stage. There's supposed to be this this interplay here. You're a an actual building meant to be able to weave back together your religious, artistic, and scientific impulses, like and actual tangible thing to do this uh, i think the same thing is is being played out in the modern academy too it's just that it's been subverted in this really interesting way like no academicians would think of what they're doing in those same terms and yet when you walk into the science building at the university i teach there's a huge auditorium and there's mm -hmm. somebody on stage and there's this sense rich experience that's happening <clears throat> and this transmission of knowledge from the initiated to the to the audience and it, it it's, in an ideal case <laughs> yeah yeah well, well in this sense i think i mean it's it's not that that isn't true it's just that when we look at our university systems today 
the reason why all that's there is because of the past. It's like a carryover from older impulses of civilization, which have, in a sense, become sort of decadent and have all of these... (laughs) <laughs> they have all of these geriatric problems <laughs> um, and aren't really able to take hold of all of the social impulses that are flowing around today and really be able to do something new with them. They actually make them worse and are intensifying them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you take a look at a university or a library or any, I mean, they're, they're all supposed to be and at one time were sacred spaces. Uh, and there is going to be a shadow of that all the way till now and even into the foreseeable future, probably. It's not like the these other streams are going to completely die away. We're always going to have the shadow of older impulses of civilization living on uh, <laughs> into, the, into the future. Long past the moment that we've all forgotten how to read, we'll still go to libraries and feel something <laughs> significant there. <laughs> Despite the fact that they're mysterious objects that we have no idea what people were trying to do with them. Yeah, it makes me think of like how much of this is the generalized form of institutional decay versus and, and therefore the necessity of new forms rising up in their stead versus the fact that there's just two possible pathways to studying nature and one has taken the back seat for the moment but could take the front seat later. Like, yeah, I don't it, think... Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, there are complementary thoughts. I don't, I don't think that you can actually, you know, say that this fits in this box and this fits in that box. If I understand idealism correctly, and this is like a really superficial read, but it's basically that there is this, the the thing that can be known is only the idea, right? It's it's the, the fact kind of that the universe is built out of ideas. And so human perception is central to the entire experience. Is that, yeah. is that a fairly yeah. simple version of it? Yeah, it's that ideas have, if we're going to set up a dichotomy here, you know, the extreme form of idealism is that ideas are primary and that matter and all the other phenomena that we end up experiencing are uh, arise through the elaboration of active ideals um, as opposed to a material point of view, which ends up taking matter as primary. And through the course of time, you end up having the elaboration of different material forms, which give rise to life, then give rise to psychic phenomena or organisms capable of psychic phenomena. And then we end up having human beings or some other form of life, which is able to then reflect upon this entire process. So it's like uh, you in Kant, for instance, you have both of these streams kind of coming together and he's trying to figure out a way uh how both can be there because obviously you can't really reduce mind to matter uh and we'll get into uh a a paper i hope before the end of this that actually like has that as its uh as its primary theme but with kant you're which is arguably like the first idealist right kicks off german idealism you have this thought process where, okay, I have the world around me. I have all, it has all its qualities, like colors, all this different stuff. And I end up coming to recognize through reflection that the thing out there that I, or what I call out there that I see isn't really out there. It's in me. Uh, That in front of me is my world picture, right? That if I end up thinking through all of the things that we know through science, that, all right, I have an image in me, but how this image arises in me comes from the light, either from the sun or from a lamp or something, hits the object, it ends up refracting off of it, and ends up coming into the eye. And from the light coming down from the sun or the lamp or whatever and hitting the object, there is a transformation that occurs. Uh, that, you know, there is now the, the nature of the light has changed because it's hit something and then it enters my eye 
it changes again, and then it ends up touching on some sort of sensorium, which ends up changing again, and thereupon I end up viewing what I call the table or whatever other object it is. And there are so many transformations occurring between the light and the arising of the image of the table in my mind that how do I know that what I experience as the table is actually how the table is in itself? It's like that's the thing in itself idea. How do I bridge this gap between myself and the world outside of me, right? This, this is always this has always kind of struck me as a little defeatist, though. Like whenever I talk to these idealists, uh, I just feel like they're kind of throwing their hands up, like like it isn't a knowable place as a result of this, or or it actually off it like tends towards this simulationist theory of existence at some point as well, which seems yeah. like deeply impractical to me. Like even if it was true, it just seems like not useful. Especially so idealism. Oh, go ahead. Oh, well, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that especially a lot of the contemporary idealists, like I'm thinking about Bernardo Kastrup or say even Don Hoffman to some you degree, my mind, yeah. where there's the sense that something, if you talk to them for long enough, you do get to the point where they agree that something must be out there that is generating the thing, right? Like there is a table. We can agree on that. We We perhaps cannot see the table in all of its delicate intricacies but we we see some portion of it and they're kind of like well we'll never really know what the table actually is i think that that's what you're referring to even though they know that they're that that they can't cling so tightly to their perspective of the world that they claim that there is no such thing as the table in and of itself like, or there's no explanation available like like the table is kind of not a great example because None of us are debating about what a table is or something, and it's an, a physical object. But maybe an I- an idea like a phenomenon, an explanation for a phenomenon, like like light, like light, for instance, or gravity. It's like th- it seems like that philosophy tends towards well, we just can't know, and I'm deeply suspicious of that tendency. And it seems well, there's okay. also the other thought. So to complement this, to just kind of give an inclination uh, in this direction, like say. A thought experiment. What if you change the senses of the organ of the organism that's doing the observing? What picture do you have of the thing now? That's generally kind of the thought process where you're trying to like get these different perspectives of the thing uh, that, okay, we are recognizing that what we observe is in some senses dependent upon our own organization, like how we come to view this thing. Now, the problem ends up coming in is now the idea that I come to about the thing based upon my organization, is it, does it have absolute relevance to the thing? Or am I, am I able to come to a complete idea of it? Or am I only able to increasingly come to greater and greater approximations of what the thing actually is? So that's that thought again, which actually underlies most of how we deal with science today. Like that thought process, we get closer and closer to the truth, yeah? like Un- Until it just that. breaks, until it just, our, our conception just completely breaks. <laughs> Which is the, uh, that's the I other think the illustration of, of coming to Mars is one of my one of my favorite examples of this. Right, we get better and better telescopes. We start to look more and more tightly at Mars, and we become more and more convinced that there's not canals on Mars. Like we've left that behind, but that there does seem to be a seasonal greening on Mars, and so there must be this vegetation that's somehow coming awake. And then we finally get to the point where we can send landers there and the landers show up and we're like, oh, God, no, we were so wrong. Except for those labeled release experiments. Yeah, but like the rovers that are on the planet right now aren't seeing a seasonal greening. They're, they're finally finding that there's just dust storms that cover the, the black rocks. And so we do see a change, but there's this process by which we get so close to the truth that all of a sudden there's this massive confirmational change where we're like, okay, new truth that we're aiming for now, which is that the planet is dead. And now we do everything to show that the planet is dead or perhaps not labeled release, as you said. So what, (laughs) 
because <laughs> we we just went all the way to the stars and maybe um i mean that's it's kind of important right that in an idealist world the celestial laws like are real things right they're not just the result of mm, material properties working together and aggregating and then all these things in a Laplacian universe start to spin around each other and that whole development of thought it has a very different one where <clears throat> at least in its origin is more platonic right that you have these archetypes that are real now the difference in idealism is that the ideas the idea is no longer a static thing like with Hegel or in Goethe, you have this idea of like the Ur phenomenon, like the primordial phenomena, but it's protean in nature. Like it's constantly changing and morphing. And the idea ends up being able to, in this morphic capacity, to be able to give rise to actual forms that you see. So that there is a, a unity between the form that you see and the form that you think. For these things to be able to come together and be an identity. Like, to be the same thing, mm. not just a reflection of the thing in your mind. Like, this is the primary difference between coming from an idealist perspective and a material perspective. Now, if you take this to its extreme... Yes, you end up coming up to the problems of basically saying, like, I can't really, if I'm taking my position from Kant, and I take it to its extreme, I can't reach the real world. Not really. I can only come to knowledge of it through inference of a bunch of different methods. Now, this isn't really, say, what the main idealists like Fichte, Hegel, or uh, Schelling would really be on about. They're not advocating for an illusionism that I'm, they're actually saying like, no, I can get to the heart of reality. It can arise in me as a complete thing that isn't just an approximation, that the idea is real. Um, and it is not just a representation of the thing, but it is actually the law which gives the thing the form and makes it be what it is, right? So this is this, this main difference in, in approach. And what isn't really accomplished with any degree of, if I'm going to put it in philosophical terms, you're looking for the unification of the subject and the object right? It's like, how do you bridge this divide? How do you bridge the divide between spirit and matter, soul and matter, from uh, a subject and object, the thing out there and my experience in here? And what Steiner ends up doing in his philosophy of freedom is very interesting in that there almost isn't really a new idea there. It's just a different way of being able to, it's a, a different reflection on the cognitive activities that you would be engaged in if you were doing a Goetheanistic type science, or if you were doing Hegelian type logic of the becoming of things, or if you were reflecting upon the identity of yourself, like the actual spiritual essence of you in a Fichtean sense. Or if you're looking at the development of the world and culture and the interrelationship between myth and reality in a historical sense like Schelling. Like all of this is brought together in a coherent way to be able to say that when I reflect on my own thinking, I'm actually, I can have a very objective set of laws that I'm observing. I don't take at the outset this assumption, like Kant does, of this whole line of scientific development and say that the world is my mental picture, quote, that the what is in me is actually in me. He says, no, 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 no. What is actually occurring is that the thinking process, there's this whole line of thought that I've produced this wall between me and the world. 
And this wall isn't real. <laughs> Not really. It's in some sense an illusion that when I am able to take my own thought as an object of my observation, that the subject and object are here, united. It is at this point when I am able to observe my own thinking process as a real reality, and I'm able to elaborate its laws through my own thinking process, that I have this certain point that Descartes was actually seeking for. That it's from here that I can actually be the producer of the, of the activity of knowing. Like the thing that for nature is already given to me in my own conscious process, I am actually the producer of it. I don't have to assume anything because I know everything about, at least from the inside, how the thought is produced. And it's then from that point that when you start to begin to think into scientific directions, into the outside world, that there's no longer this divide. Like how I feel as a whole totality, the, my own will impulses, my thought impulses, and my feeling impulses are all woven together as one whole reality. So that this, if you call it the artistic inspiration that you might experience when you're looking at a tree or a flower or something like this is completely and intimately united with what the flower is. It's my thought of it and my aesthetic appreciation of it isn't some addendum. It's actually, Im it is completely interwoven into the fact that that flower is there. <laughs> And so, how does this lead us to an, I, I don't want to say a new approach, but a different approach to this vein that we've mined out? Because I think that we've reached the place where, where Steiner has emerged, he's offered a more integrated perspective on nature than, say, Kant does, where there's the separation. Now Steiner's saying, no, there's no separation, there is this entwinement of the self with nature which in some ways is very divine right like it, it's hard for me to not see the divinity of the universe come out of this because the way that we even talk about darwinian evolution it's like natural selection is this external force that acts upon us that produces these changes and the conversation of well what does the fish want or what does the chimp want or what does the dinosaur wants as it's driven forward through time isn't considered or even really a possible it's not even a glimmer of possibility like will is so far removed from the picture that nobody's even thinking about it and it creates all these confusions right so it's like like shiloh was saying with kant if you separate the thing in itself from your experience of the thing there's this eternally this boundary which People use to produce simulation theories where really everything is being generated and there's something that lies beyond space-time that's producing these illusory qualities that we interact with, but we have no sense of what reality is really like. And I think that's really alienating because if you live in a game, if you live in a world that's wholly fictitious, there's not really anything for you there. It's just this thing that you're subject to but if the alternative is that you actually have a will and a desire and that shapes you and the way that the world interacts with you to create the will and the desire is meaningful and significant then you have a way of looking at the world where it's like okay understanding yourself and understanding your taste and understanding what culture really is and, and how broad is it across the biological and astrophysical community kingdoms i don't know lack of a better word like how how much does culture present itself in places we would not be expecting it to yeah absolutely like i've been toying a lot recently with the idea that the only thing that's really really important is to develop taste and like everything else is just window dressing because that ultimately is at the heart of the knowledge that we seek, the goods that we produce, the ideas that we find valuable, the movies that we think are interesting, like everything comes down to having taste about what's good and what isn't. And I hate to use the word good because it's so simplistic, 
but I don't have a better word because it's not about instru- it's not about like what is maximally instrumentalizable. It's more about the sense of what is more most cosmic and most divine, which can only be reached through this alternative pathway because the last few, let's say the last 150, 200 years of science have been all about extraction and mechanical production and uh, the wringing out of the world. And now it seems like everybody's like, okay, well, we've wrung everything that we can wring out of the world. We have the cancer drugs, we have the technology, we have the antibiotics, we have the internet. What do we do now? And it seems like the answer, the reason that people are so interested in Steiner is because Steiner's idea of, okay, let's break down the wall between the idea and the thing and realize that it is all one. And from there, you can develop a taste for what the future in a meaningful way can look like. It's, it's, it's man's search for meaning through a scientific lens. Is that yes. fair? It's, that's fair. Uh, I would also say that beyond taste, I mean, your taste and the way you're describing it gives rise to uh, ethics. Mm. Uh, and if you, from a reductionist point of view, right, morals can't be anything, morality can't be anything but a shadow phenomenon. It can't mm. actually have a uh, productive power in and of itself that morals can't actually direct the development of anything not really because if you reduce all of your brain activity and all of your thoughts to some dependent that uh, for all of these things to be dependent upon some organismic uh uh relationship then it's not actually the moral it's not that the moral idea is not what's actually guiding your actions, how you're building uh, a device or how you end up deciding to structure society. Like if you want to be able to deal with moral problems, morals have to be real and you have to be able to have a way that these morals can be dealt with on the same epistemological level as scientific facts. Mm. Like without that, that reminds me of Ayn Rand or something. It's really interesting. Huh. We, we last, uh, I think back in April, if anybody wants to check it out, we did a breakdown of this, gradu- I think it was a graduation speech Ayn Rand gave to MI- this group of MIT engineers that was graduating. And she was basically chastising the way that education was being done and that these people were being trained to calculate and calculate and calculate, but given very little inspiration or guidance in terms of the values that their brains were being put in service of and and kind of you know whether you love her whether you agree or disagree with Ayn Rand's particular values she was certainly uh, leading this charge for people in the scientific community developing a sense of values because the alternative is kind of what we're looking at right now like I look at people I went did my PhD with like they're working for you know kind of crummy pharmaceutical things, like kind of gross different firms, maybe like, I don't want to call people out, but like yeah, they're either surveillance on Wall state crap, like yeah. And yeah, Wall Street, right? There's no sense of being guided by your values forward as an engineer in the, or, or a scientist in the landscape that we're dealing with right now. I don't want to say none, like that's too totalizing. It's just, really it's just that their values are different. <laughs> <laughs> well, or they turn uh, on investment. This is the value. <laughs> that's hardly a value. I mean, everybody's got to eat. I understand, but I'm not sure yeah. accumulation of wealth is even a value. Really, it's just a biological necessity in some sense. But I just feel like the inability to even center values or develop your values, like Nastia said, tastes. And I totally agree, especially as an artist. Like all I've ever cared about as an artist was like not. I, I'm never like freaking out about technique and stuff so much as like what do I like like what really excites me about music that I listen to that really inspires me to want to create something like that's all I've ever cared about but I don't yeah how familiar are you guys with Emerson Ralph Waldo Emerson I think I read it in high school I think I was assigned it in high school and didn't read it (laughs) (laughs) there we go (laughs) yeah the truth comes out so I mean Emerson fits into this uh, this whole picture, um, and just as a as a I guess a point back to America again before we get into this other character, just want to bring up um, 
that what you're saying here, I mean, when you get a sense for what Emerson's talking about, it's this whole view again, but he ends up entering this question very often through beauty. Like you arrive at the truth and what is good through beauty. That it's this aesthetic, the aesthetic sense for him is in no way on a lower level than scientific truth. Uh, that it ends up opening and actually guides in a very tangible way how you can live your life. And like you're saying, the beauty ends up directing you in a very uh, good way <laughs> as to how, what, what are the values? Like, what do you value? And if you're going to have, if the good is going to have any substance, it has to be beautiful. Like, the beauty is not... Oh, as- I'm very skeptical of this. Very skeptical. Well, so hold on, hold on. I think that I can, I can uh, shift it in such a way where it. I think that placing beauty at the highest echelon of things is whatever. That's like that's a thing. That's a choice. But I think that what's important is to figure out what your echelon is. And I always pl- so I I guide in the summers. I t- I basically I always joke that I do. Uh, like uh, wilderness therapy for women going through midlife crises. I take them on these like four day backpacking trips. They've never been backpacking before. We're just like out in the woods. And I came up and, you know, they're, they've never hiked before, let alone with like a 40 pound pack. And so it's excruciating for them for several days. Everybody's very miserable. And so I'm always looking for ways to, to get people's minds off of what they're doing. And I play this game called What's Your Favorite? And it's like, what's your favorite bird? What's your favorite movie? What's your favorite song? What's your favorite whatever? And, you, and through this process, people learn a tremendous amount about their own tastes. Because if you ask them, what's your favorite bug? They, have, they think about it and they come up with a bug. And then you're like, well, why is that your favorite? And all of a sudden they're developing themselves the sense of like, oh, well, this is actually what I like and why I like it. And for a lot of people, I feel like that's something that they learn about themselves in the process of doing the game, which they've never stopped to think about before. And so for Emerson, probably the outcome of the game is that he would always pick the most beautiful thing that he could think of. And so that's the value structure. But for somebody else, it could be something that's like warm and fuzzy. For somebody else, it's something that's like really strong and permanent. It's Maybe for others, we know people that really love noise rock and these like really dissonant, frightening things. Like, so that's the difference between taste and beauty, right? Is that taste is something personal, but from an ideal point of view, beauty is something that's real and transcends individual taste. And the scary thing about beauty is that it can lead us astray in science, right? So, mm. so if you think about the Ptolemaic system and the obsession with the beauty of the circles, right, you can very accurately reproduce the motions of the cosmos using these, these epicycles and so forth, right? But it's completely wrong. And of course, we have this obsession with beauty and equations as well today when it comes to mathematical physics, you know. I don't know who, who got this started, but this idea, there's some famous physicist who makes the quote that not only like the key to being guided towards a, an accurate picture of physics is simplicity and beauty. And it kind of goes back to this medieval idea that God wouldn't do something clunky, right? And so, um, yeah. I would actually use that in itself. Like if you're looking at the Ptolemaic view of the universe, it's computational. It's computationally not as beautiful, right? Like you have but the perfect of, circle, <laughs> the perfect circle, the perfect ge- shape. It might be geometrically beautiful. beautiful. Have you yeah. seen those, you, uh, those trochoidals? Yeah. Yeah. You've had somebody on here that is able to simplify this ancient view and you know, be able to take the, uh, the astronomical system of TK bra and then basically remove all of your epicycles. And he's able to conceive of the things in terms of perfect circles. Now, the actual planetary motions that we observe obviously aren't perfect circles. You have all of these, like he says, trochoidal loops that you end up having. But one of the interesting things about circles is 
Like if you're going from a circle, you're, you can calculate it and be able to give its definition from the center point to a radius, you know, all the way around. Now you end up, you go from a circle, you end up going to something of an ellipse. Now, now you have to have these two factors. You're basically, you're adding, you have an addition factor. It's not just a center point. You end up going to your hyperbola and you're now in a, a subtractive mode. Now you end up going to another geometric form, which was really crucial for the development of astronomy, the Cassini curve, right? You end up having a multiplication factor. Now at the tail end again, what happens if you use a div if you use division? You have a circle again. So you're actually able to take like you, you can simplify it all the way down to a circle. But in a certain sense, you've just simplified when you're looking out there. The reality is actually a bunch of really complicated motions. You can simplify it, give a computational beauty to the thing, but then you actually lose the living beauty, which is, as we alluded to earlier in the conversation, is actually incalculable. It's constantly changing and moving and doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that. So when so the... If you end up having a just a sliver, if I'm going to make an argument for beauty here, that you can see casts of beauty, but to be able to actually see what is beautiful and unbeautiful, and uh, and the way that they bring and and how they can bring about a higher beauty, like this is more what he's going at, and that it's this kind of beauty, which is in a sense a unity with the good and the true, the old platonic uh, ideal of the good, the true, and the beautiful, right? That you aren't able to really, they're all different faces of each other. That if you look at something and it's true, it's also going to be beautiful. And if you look at something that's actually truly beautiful, it's going to be good. And if you look at something that's good, the good is going to also, by necessity, be true and beautiful. Like, that's sort of this <laughs> this little the circle that you get uh, going going in when you think in that way. And yet, nature can be quite the opposite of good and beautiful, right? I mean, there's all sorts of gnarly natural processes unfolding. Not to mention ragged, complex, and just inelegant processes unfolding. But in that, you end up coming to, a ba again, the discussion of the good. Because how do you end up having something, how do you know what's good without something that's evil? Yes. Right. The, the, like, they're, they're not simple questions. I'm just trying to give a little bit of a direction to how these have been dealt with by this whole stream that we've been talking about. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so, and, and so I think that instead of getting lost in the weeds of like what is good and what is true and what is beautiful, which people have been arguing about for. As long as they've been arguing about anything. Yeah. Like, I think that we probably won't settle it in the next half hour or so. So if for the sake of putting, I, I'm, I don't think that this is our last conversation. I think that there's clearly like a lot of stuff left to cover. Yeah, I feel like we're going to have to meet up again and talk about Dewey Larson. It's too big of a conversation. And we've been meaning to do it for so long. We have been. And so, Steve, if you're listening, we'll do Dewey Larson at some point, I promise. Uh, but the, I, I want to end somewhere where there's a handle where we can pick up for next time. Okay. Which is that we've we laid out these two streams. We've laid out the idea that the transcendentalists and the idealists play this really important role in conceiving of our own part in studying nature. And then that Steiner suggested that perhaps there isn't this barrier of idea versus reality. And now the question is, okay, how does this apply to the situation where we have run out of runway with our current scientific paradigms? Like, can we land on that? I kind of asked the idiotic what, what question. What does the path forward look like? Is that yeah, but the question? I think, so, or like, how do, how do we apply these uh, spirits it's of like, the past, these approaches of the past to the future? But I think I asked an idiotic question before, which is like, well, what's wrong with the status quo? 
And I feel like we kind of talked around that a little bit, but like what improvements would we like to see? And how are these traditions threads? informing that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good question. Okay. That's, I think, really needs more than 30 minutes to be able to do. Uh, we've got, <laughs> we have talked about and alluded to the general social dynamics, like from the reality of uh, just economic forces and the inertia that they have when they get a hold of scientific development, it drags it along with them. And we have all of these side effects of our medicines, for instance, like we have good medicine, but the medicines are poisons at the same time. Uh, no. Nothing, yeah. I mean, it's true. Nothing is, there's a friend of mine, he has a, as a statement, nothing is more injurious to health than a really good insurance policy. <laughs> you know, um, so there are strong developments in these directions, but when you look behind the curtain, they all have these side effects. Uh, it's because they don't deal with holes, and that's the problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you want a medicine that can deal with the whole human being, you need a science that starts with the whole human being. And not with its atomic constituents and its chemical composition and all of this stuff. Uh, if you want to deal with an organism, you need to be able to think in terms of organism. If you want to be able to solve psychic traumas, you need to be able to think in terms of soul phenomena and not have to reduce it to some neurological state. If you're going to try to deal with a spiritual ailment, you need to be able to deal with this lack of purpose, if you will, on its own terms, and you can't have proxies. That would be, again, like why it's necessary, but like in terms of actually giving a concrete direction forward, that was the reason why we had a whole three-day conference, is it's not so easy. <laughs> um, it's or- also interesting how holistic approaches to things often get co-opted or subverted or lose their um yeah it's crazy. you know when i hear like holistic medicine i i'm it's a like on its face that's a brilliant idea but the way that it plays out in instantiations is often really cringe at the same time and yeah. so it's like it becomes a cult of wellness of some kind where the the people that are involved don't don't seem to be fundamentally different from the people that are selling pharmaceutical drugs they just happen to be selling, you know, crystals and healing waters. And so it's coming from a different direction, but it's still just this brazen commercial enterprise, which you're like, well, that doesn't seem very healy, does it? Yeah. Maybe I can give a, a concrete example. Sure. Um, so one of the, I mentioned a lady to you at the conference, uh, and her name was Lily Calisco. Now, she ended up taking some, she was an anthroposophist, one of the early ones, and she took the indications that were given from Steiner as to how to study the relationship of the stars on material substances. And one of the other things that she ends up doing out of this is something which is very important, basically, for really being able to study the potencies of substances. And I use potencies, the homeopathic potencies, right? That's why I'm jumping into this, is that when you get into her work, you begin to realize, like, what most of the homeopaths are doing, that you can show results, right? that there is some effect that's going on. She ends up taking, say, the just as a, I'll make it general and a little abstract, but say you, you take a particular substance, particular metal, and you end up uh, potentizing it, right? 
all the way down to the point where, as far as we're materially concerned, there's nothing in the vial. But this vial, when you take a bunch of wheat plants and you end up watering the wheat plants with these things, you are able to show a marked effect on its growth pattern from germination just to the next couple of you know leaflets. She ends up taking a look. It's like, all right, what are the time cycles? How long does it take for it to grow? How big does it grow? She does these in larger batches. And it's like, okay, well, this leaf comes out here and the next leaf comes out at a certain distance. And these things end up going forward and backward. And the whole mass of the plant is actually dependent upon the substance that she's the substance that she's potentized but the effects are not constant now if you end up potentizing this substance uh, you end up saying it has a factor of 10 less than a real substance in the vial you go to a a factor of 100 uh, you end up having a complete reversal in the graph whereas initially you would have a stimulation of growth in another instance, you would have a retardation of growth, retardation of growth from your uh, 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 from your from your fixed from your fixed reference point, right? Now, it, and it keeps on going, so you end up having these oscillations in the graph as to the effect of the potentized substances, how potentized they are on on the growth. Now. This is going to be different depending upon what the metal is or what the plant is. But when you look at a homeopathic doctor, a lot of the times they're just going to some table. They're saying, all right, well, this substance does this. And there isn't really, because there isn't a scientific study, you haven't really upped your level in terms of how you can study the influence of a thing which is not physically present in a vial on the growth process, right? There's nothing materially there. We scientifically just say, all right, well, there's nothing there, so there's no effect. But you see an effect. How do you set up a series of experiments so that you can study the reality of matter, which has somehow turned itself inside out? <laughs> you have this substance. It is not present. It's non-local, but it has an effect on the growth process, a very clear, statistically irremovable effect on the growth of the plant. How do you deal with that? And she does this again with just water, like not any kind of substance, but to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to study the effect of the moon cycles on the germination and immediate growth processes in this, say this wheat or this corn does it over this, over the course of like nine years, right. And a whole slew of a number of different variations and shows and what in this particular plant, the new moon is actually beneficial. Now, if you really want it to grow well, you need to make sure that you end up having the water. Uh, you need to water the plant and it needs to be primed and ready two days before the full moon. If it's going to be the full moon, which actually makes the thing grow better. Like, so to actually take these older uh, folk agricultural traditions, if you will, and have a real scientific basis and be like, say, no, if you want to grow this plant, these are the kinds of lunar conditions that you need for it to actually grow better. And like the scales that you're talking about, you, you might initially think like it's a small effect. And when you read the, say the, the book, I think it's moon and plant growth. It's only about a hundred pages. You begin to realize that this is not a small effect at all. Like you're dealing with very potent, uh, a very potent effect on life processes. Like the moon and the sun and their relationship to the earth are 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 very. <laughs> you can study their relationships exactly. It doesn't need to be woo woo. It can be just as hard of a science, if you will, as. Uh, just the, the study of the properties of motion like it it can be it need not be something that flies off into the stars you can stay with your feet firmly planted on the ground and study the interrelationships between here and there um, and one of the other guys that comes out of this whole movement his name's Carl Unger 
Um, and he is kind of gets into the be the deterioration of the anthroposophical society, even both of these characters. So one of the reasons why even in anthros anthroposophical circles, you don't deal with Lily Kalisco much is because her and her husband were kicked out of the society in 1935, along with basically all of the other, uh, all the other scientists and, eco and, and, and economists. Um, so you end up having, yeah, as you're coming up to World War II, the thing kind of disintegrates. This other guy, I think he dies in 1929. He's, he's shot um, after, a, after a lecture that he gives. Um, High stakes. Yeah. I mean, I, I haven't looked into the circumstances of that very, very closely, but at the very least, it is quite the stroke of fate, if you want to put it that way. Um, he was the one who ended up taking Rudolf Steiner's philosophy of freedom and delved into the actual logical structures from a Hegelian point of view that are at play in it, showing how the, the identity, like the logical structure of I <laughs> and this process of you coming to meaning through negation, right? This whole way of the, you end up having a thing and its opposite and how through these contradictions, you end up actually coming to understand things and yourself. And the, at the end of his work, he ends up pointing a direction to what's necessary, logically speaking, for a new science. That when you're dealing with most of our science at his time, that you have explicated the relation, spatial relationships very effectively. But what had not been done was actually to be able to develop a science of time. To be able to deal with time and temporal relationships as real things. Like have a science of rhythms, if you will. Um, biology starts to dip its toes in this direction by necessity. Um, be, and like chronobiology, stuff like this. But to really be able to deal with time on its own terms and not as some quasi space or just some unreal thing, which is uh, just an illusion produced by the movement of a bunch of particles. Um, but that time being real, which this is a decent sort of stepping point to dealing with the two guys that we didn't really get to yet one of them was Wil Wilman Henry Sheldon he was actually a he was the head of the Yale uh, philosophy department for many many years uh, so it's kind of strange that you don't really know about him um, there are people who study process philosophy for instance or the history of pragmatism and I end up asking about this guy, and he's literally in the whole mix of that, and they don't know who he is. Uh, and it's 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 curious. Um, there is a paper, relatively short one, that I would actually suggest both of you read um, because it's directly uh, you you had mentioned in our pre talk talk that you have sort of a a dualistic approach to things and. From a scientific perspective, you really like to remain within a, a material mechanical explanation of things. Um, when this paper is for really, physics, yeah, for physics, yeah. Um, so he's uh, honestly, this is why I think both Larson and Sheldon are necessary for being able to move forward. Both of these guys know nothing about really this whole stream that we've talked about. I mean, Sheldon does; he's a philosopher. Um, but he, in his exposition, he's not really talking about it quite in this way. He is going to say, however, and point to the polar differences. He's, ha he's dealing with a, a worldview that says, all right, materialism and idealism are two halves of the same coin. And uh, monism and dualism or pluralism are two halves of the same coin. And scholasticism and what is coming about in his day as process philosophy are two aspects of the same thing. Scholasticism, for instance, has really 
It's like these fixed ideas of the hierarchical order of things, whereas a process philosophy is dealing with this eternal becoming, and that the becoming isn't some lesser reality like it is in uh, the older uh, Greek-influenced scholasticism, but actual higher order being. And then with materialism and idealism, that when you begin to take a look closer and closer and closer as to how idea materialists actually think, you begin to realize it's a very strange form of idealism um, because they end up having, like we said, this sort of Kantian holdover where they're not really entirely sure that they're dealing with the thing. They have these models of how all these things should work. So the world ends up becoming the model that's in their head and you're never really dealing with the real thing. <laughs> uh, and then the idealists in an extreme form are actually just a bunch of materialists because they don't want to investigate matter enough. So they basically end up throwing up their hands and giving the whole field to the materialists anyway. You end up saying, well, everything's my idea, but these ideas at the last resort actually end up being conditioned by material conditions anyway. So uh, it might all be ideal from our point of view, but you end up just allowing a material mode of thought to carry the whole day. Um, this is his whole... To end the disputations between these different camps was his whole philosophical teaching project that it doesn't really appear that it came to a whole lot in the development of, of everything. But you have a prominent philosopher at one of the most prominent universities anywhere trying to deal with the polarities or dualities and the development of human thought. Da. Um, which, what was the name of the essay? Uh, soul and matter. Soul and matter. How, how yeah. epic. That sounds like a record. It really does. Yeah. I mean, it's the, it's, a Motown. it's the quickest way. I mean, you, there was a, an interview, one of the few interviews that I listened all the way through when you guys were, I forget his name, um, trying, you had the question what's the hard problem of consciousness? Like, I don't understand why it's a hard problem. <laughs> Yosha Bach, yeah. <laughs> Um, so that one yeah, ended so, a little sideways. <laughs> yeah, wait, what? That one ended a little sideways. Uh, my yeah, I thought it was entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hold on, hold on. I want to talk about this. Yeah, but we, we just um, got to the we often get to the meat with people. We, yeah, right at the very end, and then it's sad. I think we got to actually this exact point of like the material versus the ideal. But what was the what was the observation yeah. that you made? Sorry, yeah. So, yeah, it's uh, three different things. And the reason why I was even thinking that this was a good jumping off point from Carl Unger into, uh, into Larson is that he addresses the fundamental qualitative differences between matter and mind. And not in the sense of trying to disprove materialism, because this isn't his project. And he even gets to that at the end where he ends up saying what's really necessary is for materialism materialistic thought to be able to upgrade itself to be able to consider matter in a much broader sense because that is what is necessary from our observations of our actual experience of reality that and this very much is larson's whole field um to be able to have a what he calls a reciprocal to matter or a cosmic matter um you'll end up noting a lot of the same kind of thinking in what's necessary for dealing between earthly forces and heavenly forces, if you will, or cosmic forces when you're looking at Lily Kalisko's work or any of the stuff coming out of anthroposophy, that there's this polar relationship here, a polar geometry necessary. So instead of a Euclidean centralized point of view, which Larson doesn't totally come over, what is necessary, and he ends up describing without really thinking about it, is it's polar opposite, quite literally. You're dealing with projective geometry, uh, where the center point is actually now an inf infinite periphery, that there is a, uh, a, a, even though they're opposites, a logical identity, how you can switch from a center to an infinite periphery, and you can still remain coherent in the transformation between this geometric shape or thing, and it's turning it completely inside out, and where it is, its center is now non-local, right? Um, 
So and, that will require some unpacking. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Unpacking. I'm just I'm giving yeah just some indications for a, a future discussion in that line. Like this was where I, I was hoping to end with being able to go from Sheldon's essay on soul and matter, where he ends up pointing out, all right, the point of my experience of memory is incongruent with how we observe matter to operate. There, You can't ever have material relationships, which are a past event. You can only have present events. And our experience of memory is basically something where, regardless of whatever you want to say about its neurological correlates, that the actual experience of pastness, the, the fact that it, a past event can be present at all in the mind and be to be aware that it is past, is incompatible with a material, normal material point of view. So in terms of space, you have mind and matter being incompatible, at least on this point. And then, in, I'm sorry, in terms of time, not space, next he ends up going to the spatial incongruity where for our experience, you end up looking around you and something that is even as far away as the moon is just as immediately present for consciousness if you will, our experience as the book that's on that other table to me over there. There, a, a vast distance ends up, you know, separating all of these different phenomenon, but in us, they are united as a single thing. This unification of immense distances is not something that takes place in matter. You have discrete spatial steps between here and there. Um, and this last point ends up going into, again, that unification factor. When you end up looking at the ex our experience of what we call qualities, like a color or something like that, what reaches us from the outside from a material point of view is a succession of things, a succession of events. But it's all united as a single quality when it ends up arising for us. It's the, These are the the hard the hard qualitative differences in a spatial temporal and multiplicative or unitary sense for the soul um and then he ends up going into attention one instead of going all the way through i'll probably just come to the end again the thing that uh, Rang presented was these pictures where Gotha was doing these experiments of he's like, okay, so if you were in a dark room and you had a prism that you were holding upright, what would you see? If you were in a light room and you were holding the prism uh, upside down, what would you see? And so there's this sense of let us take in the whole spectrum of what is possible. And then once we have understood it from all of these different directions, then perhaps we can start to make progress again. But we have for so long been just mining one vein that we have come to it where it's like, okay, let's look at what else is there. So maybe I'll, well, one critical element there, like the picture that uh, Shiloh ended up pulling up of the polar opposite of Newton's experiment, he almost never did that kind. So the ones you're describing, instead of having the colors projected onto a screen, he's pulling the thing up and looking into it. The screen is in him <laughs> and not outside, right? So the whole way of approach is turned inside out. And I think that the, the idea of us as the interpreters, as opposed to us as simply the detectors, is kind of where this approach leads us. And for the next time, I think that we should talk about soul and matter. We should talk about Larson. We should talk about Sheldon. We should talk about all these things. But let us digest a little bit. Let us send this out into the world, see what questions people have. Maybe there's some topics that we glanced over too lightly that people didn't really get a deep enough sense of. And then once we have that kind of laid out, I think we should have another conversation because it, it, it's really it's really fun to talk to you. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's been good. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time and for giving me a framework for what happened at the conference. So for those, for, I've, I've mentioned the conference a bunch on the show. It was called the Renewal of Science, and it was basically just all of these people from all around the world who came together from, you know, Cambridge professors to uh, experimentalists. Uh, in As far as I can tell, Soren doesn't have a, a university affiliation. He's just I been... No, 
Yeah. He's actually, we uh, we just talked to him yesterday. He's going to come on the podcast in a couple oh, weeks. Oh, all right, good. And good. so, but there's just all these people that are like, hey, something's not right with the world and nobody's paying attention to this and they're doing these experiments to show that something has been forgotten. And I've never been to a scientific conference, which is all about unearthing these things that are in plain sight, but fully ignored. And so I really appreciate what you, Gopi, Snetu, and Billy are doing. I want to end on a note, a quote, if we could. So this is, uh, uh, this is Emerson. In this lecture, he's, or in this uh, essay, Compensation, he's talking about uh, one of, he ends up getting into polarity. Like basically the whole stuff that we would have been dealing with in that conference. One of the things that we tried to do, you are pointing out that there's people from all over the world from different walks. And the whole trajectory that I've given, and one of the reasons I was trying to bring up Sheldon or Larson at the end is that they're not connected, in, at least in their own minds, in quite the way I've laid it out. Um, but the spirit in which we were trying to approach this conference was to be able to be able to show how all of these different ways of trying to approach this problem that we've outlined are all really working uh, towards the same purpose. And uh, yeah, just in that, in that, on that note, it came from thought above the will of the writer that this is the best part of each writer, which has nothing private in it. That which he does not know that which flowed out of his constitution and not from his too active invention. That which in the study of a single artist you might not easily find, but in the study of many, you would abstract as the spirit of them all. So that's very much the the spirit in which oh, we were trying to bring all, all of those folks together. Uh, just to wrap up the whole thought, going all the way back to the beginning of the Renaissance and pointing above into the world in this whole stream, that even though people might be coming at it from wildly different points of view that there's something that actually threads all of these things together that aren't necessarily immediately apparent in each individual person until you take a look at the whole. I love it. Yeah. Really where, uh, by the way, where can people find you? Where's it? Are you, you've got a website or do you do social media or anything like that? Um, so really my only presence online is through, uh, the renewal of culture. So our foundation website, renewal of culture, uh, dot org. We started to get into uh, social media stuff a little bit in preparation for the conference. We, uh, have some introductory stuff, uh, to the conference itself that is already out there kind of spattered this way and that way, but we're actually pulling together. We had all the talks recorded. We had the the exhibits, uh, video, the number of interactions. So we're going to have all of those up on the site as well as on our YouTube. Um, hopefully sometime in the very near future, uh, as well as some of the steps forward uh, that we were taking, taking out of that whole endeavor. So, uh, yeah, that's too... Uh, yeah, to be determined. <laughs> I mean, we have a solid idea, but we haven't, uh, yeah, that platform hasn't been built yet. You were also talking about the need for patronage. Do you guys have a platform where you're looking for patrons of some kind? Well, I mean, we've got, uh, we've got donate links on the site, but that's really it. We don't have a, a Patreon uh, you know, page or anything like that. So I think we've got PayPal. I think we've got Venmo. Um and then and if yeah. you want to give millions of dollars, it's a nonprofit, right? So you can yeah, get a tax break. Five hundred one c three. No, yeah. quite. Yeah, if you have large sums of money and you don't want the government <laughs> to get them, like please consider. <laughs> you never, you never know. We've, I mean, we've had people tell us they want to give us a lot of money, and then we mentioned that we're not a nonprofit, and they're like, oh, okay, yeah, so, tax yeah. deductible. Uh, another thing, maybe to note <laughs> is that we're the board is unable to be we like with some nonprofits. You and especially a lot of the larger foundations, right? The uh, the salaries for these people are very large, uh, in the hundreds of thousands, if not more. Uh, so they rake in a lot of money, and then the people managing it make a lot of money. Uh, ooh, based upon how we're structured, we can't get paid. So it's all volunteer. It's about us. 
if that is. All right, man. Well, we'll, uh, we'll go back and forth over email, but I'll, I want to sit down again soon and talk and finish this conversation at least. All right. It's been good talking to you both. Yeah. Thanks, Austin. Thanks, Austin. Bye, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Yep. Bye. Yeah.